is paid. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the regulatory section of the Planning Regulatory Service Committee. Can I remind you that when speaking into your microphone, you need to wait until you see yourselves on the screens so the live feed can pick up your comments. If you speak before your image is projected, those listening on the live feed will not hear anything that you say. This is obviously particularly important in the case of a vote being required. Audio recording is being used to assist in preparing the formal minutes. Therefore, anyone participating in the meeting consents to it being recorded and being live streamed on YouTube. Agenda item one, apologies. We have an apology from Councillor McDone. Do we have any other apologies? Councillor O'Dowd, please. Thanks, Chair. I was just saying, uh, Councillor Duffy will be here, but he's just running late. That's maybe him now. Um, no other ones? Okay, so agenda item two, declarations of interest. We can take the declarations now or as we come across them. Okay. Move on to agenda item three, report from the head of planning. We have 3.1, which is an item of information. I'm going to bring in Oshin Hamill, Principal Planning Officer, to present the report on planning application case loads. Over to yourself, Oshin, please. Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, members. The purpose of this report is to update members in relation to current planning case loads. Um, as I set out in the report, the department issued 111 decisions in the month of March, and a total of 121 applications were received in the same period, which is high, but not unexpected at this time of year. Um, the overall case load has increased slightly, but currently sits at 983. Um, there were five call-in requests received during this period, and the current enforcement case load sits at 390 live cases. Thank you, members, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Wuxin. Don't see any lights on. Okay. Thank you very much, Wuxin. Move on to agenda item four, report from the head of building. We have two items for decision, 4.1, 4.2, street naming report for Brackenwood and Kirkville Close, etc. And I'm going to bring in Tom Lavery to present both reports. And uh, Tom, over to yourself, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, item 4.1. This is a request for the naming of a housing development consisting of 51 dwellings off Bracken Road and Portadown, and details are in Appendix 1. The applicant's preferred name for this development is Bracken Wood, and the applicant's main reason for the preferred name is that it's a continuation of the, of the use of the uh, Bracken, as it has become synonymous with the location. So, officer of assessed and deemed the proposal is compliant, and the recommendation, therefore, is to our members for, is for approval for the name Bracken Wood. Thank you, Chair. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Tom. Members, any questions? No questions. Can I take a proposal and a seconder, please? Propose. Proposed by the Vice Chair and seconded by Councillor O'Dowd. It's both at the same time. Whichever one. Yeah, do you want to do rock, paper, scissors? Yeah. <laughs> okay, second by Councillor O'Dowd. We all agreed. Thank you very much, members. And 4.2, um, Kirkfield Close, etc. And again, bring in Tom. Thank you, Chair. I guess 7.4.2, this is a request for the naming of a housing development consisting of 85 uh, dwellings of Carrickville and Lurgan. Uh, members may recall that the street name Carrickville Park for the initial section of this development was approved by Council in March 2021. Officers have advised the applicant that the remainder of the whole development could actually be postal numbered off the Carrickville Park. Um, however, the applicant has chosen to submit a number of names for the different sections of the remaining development. And details and maps, etc., are in Appendix 2. The applicant's preferred name for these further sections of the development are Carrigal Close, Carrigal Drive, Carrigal Grove, and Carrigal Muse. And the applicant's main reason for the preferred names uh, is that they feel this is the appropriate way to continue the name Carrigal throughout the development, and that they also believe it identifies different sections of the development going forward. So, officers have assessed and deemed the report as, as compliant with the Council's uh, uh, policy. And the recommendation, therefore, is for members' uh, approval of the suggested names. Thank you, Chair. I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Tom. Again, members, any questions on the report? No questions. Can I get a proposer? 
proposed by Councillor Donnelly and seconded by Councillor O'Dowd. We all agreed? Agreed. Thank you very much, members. And then 4.3, item for information, update and planning control and property certificate applications. And again, over to Tom. Thank you, Chair. This is uh, just keep members informed of the workload undertaken by the department during the last 12 months. Uh, as members have seen in Appendix 3, we received um, 3,000 in the last 12 months, we've received um, 3,084 building regulation applications with a notional construction investment value in the area of just over 186.29 million. We've also carried out just over uh, 14,400 site inspections and undertaken uh, almost 1,900 plan assessments and issued all the relevant statutory notices. The department also continues to deliver the council's property certificate function for the convention of properties across the borough. In the last 12 months, we've received and administered 3,218 new applications and issued 3,220 certificates to solicitors and agents relating to property sales. The department has also been dealing with a very high number this year of dangerous structures incidents um, since the 1st of April. Uh, these have ranged in severity from loose slates falling off roofs to the extreme of partial building collapses resulting in road closures uh, for uh, public safety reasons. In total, there have been 32 incidents uh, since April last year. And currently, we still have uh, several ongoing cases. Thank you, Chair. This is for members' information, but I'm happy to take any questions members may have. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tom. Any questions or queries, members? No. Thank you, Tom. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, may you be on to agenda item five corresponds. We don't have any. And I call Kestrel Dowd to declare. Go ahead. Thanks, Chair. There's just one item in confidential I'd like to declare a pecuniary interest in. Sorry, non pecuniary interest. Okay, Julie noted. Members, can I seek a proposal and second there to go into confidential business? Proposed by Councillor Lavery and seconded by Councillor Armstrong. We all agreed? Agreed, thank you. Members and online viewers, in accordance with Schedule 6 of the Local Government Act, we will now be moving into a confidential session of the Council. This means that we turn off the public feed of the meeting. This will be returned when the meeting is restarted. Can I ask ATC or ICT officers to please turn off the live feed and confirm them with me the confidential session of the meeting can proceed.
Thank you very much. There's nothing in that EOB, so uh, we have agenda eight. Any other relevant business? We have nothing, okay, members. So we're going to pause um, until 4 p.m. till uh, the planning applications part, okay? So see you all.
Thank you. Agenda item seven, applications for planning permission to be considered by the committee as per the schedule of planning applications. <laughs> Welcome back, members. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the planning section of the Planning Regulatory Service Committee. Can I remind you that when speaking into your microphone that you need to wait until you see yourselves on the screens so the delay feed can pick up your comments. If you speak before the image is projected, those listening on the live feed will not hear anything you say. This is obviously particularly important in the case of a vote being required. Audio recording is being used to assist in the preparing of formal minutes. Therefore, anyone participating in the meeting consents to being recorded and live streamed on YouTube. Also, during the course of this meeting, questions may be asked by councillors who are members of the Planning and Regulatory Service Committee of Planning Officers, applicants for planning permission, objectors or those speaking on their behalf. In doing so, councillors endeavour to ascertain the information which they feel is necessary to enable them to determine the application. However, members of the public should note that councillors will not reach a conclusion as to whether an application should be approved, refused or deferred until the debate on the application has concluded. Okay, members, Appendix 2 has been um, has been pulled from today after this afternoon's applications. Okay. Moving on to Appendix 1. Okay, application number LA08 2022 1544F and an approval. Members, those who were at the site meeting was Alderman Wilson, councillors Donnelly, Lavery, Mulholland, Armstrong, and Mutri. Members, as I was not able to attend the site meeting, I'm going to ask Alderman Wilson to take over the chair, as we have been previously, I haven't received the full information, which is why I'm declaring an interest in it and I can't proceed with me. So is Alderman Wilson happy to proceed? Yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay, members, thank you. So uh, I have a few lights on here, so I'll start with Councillor Duffy. Thank you, Chair. I was not the site meeting now, so I'm taking part. Okay, Councillor Hockey. Thank you, Chair. I'm the same as Councillor Duffy. I wasn't at the site meeting, so I'll not be taking part. Thank you. Fine, no problem. Councillor O'Dowd. Thank you, Chair. No, I wasn't that was unable to attend the site meeting as well. So I will not be taking part. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Mallow. I was unable to attend the site visit, so I'll not take part either. Well, our Councillor Kennedy, our Alderman Kennedy. Thank you, Chair. I was unable to attend the site meeting, so I'll set this one out. <laughs> Okay, Councillor Wilson. Yes, thank you, Chair. I'm in the same vein. I was un unavailable to attend the site meeting, so I'll be taking part. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we will move to um, Roisin, who is the Principal Planning Officer in this one, so we will ask her to bring her report. There you are. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. This application seeks full planning permission for the erection of a 20 metre telecommunications column and associated head frame, ancillary works and cabinet on lands adjacent and northwest of 46 to 50 Lurgan Road, Portadown. Members will recall this application was previously presented to the Planning and Regulatory Services meeting in December with a recommendation to approve. At that meeting, it was agreed that the application be deferred pending a site visit by members. The site visit was held on the 14th of December 2023 and details of the visit are set out in the report. Following the site visit, a further letter of objection and petition were received and consideration of the matters raised are also set out in detail in the site visit report. An addendum has also been circulated this morning following the receipt of a further representation. 
At the site visit, members had queried why the proposed mast could not be located on a building within the SRC or Glen Dimplex complex. For clarity, officers have queried this with the agent who has advised that these options were considered but discounted. In relation to the SRC building, in order to meet the ICNIRP requirements, the antenna would need to be elevated significantly above the rooftop, which would require the construction of a lattice style mast, and this would both visually intrusive and potentially detrimental to the structural integrity of the host building. The coverage plots provided show the key areas where the existing network is under significant pressure, and this is to the area around the hospital and south of the SRC campus. An installation at the northern end of Glen Dimplex would fail to adequately address the coverage issues due to the separation distances involved, while an installation at the southern end of the complex within the car park would not benefit from the same level of tree screening as the current proposed site and would be therefore much more visually prominent. Queries were also raised with regard to the width of the proposed monopole in relation to the existing lighting columns. Um, the circumference of the base of the monopole is 0.49 millimetres and the circumference of the base of a lighting column is 0.25. Therefore, the width would be roughly twice the size of the standard lighting column in terms of circumference. Officers are satisfied that sufficient information has been submitted to comply with the requirements of policy in terms of the need for the proposed development and consideration of mass sharing and alternative sites. Officers are of the opinion that the proposal meets the policy requirements of TEL 1 of PPS 10 and the corresponding sections of the SPPS and are presenting the application with an unchanged recommendation to approve subject to the conditions set out in the report. And I'm happy to go through the slides again with you. And the red arrow shows you the location of the site within the general area with Glen Dimplex to the north there. And this is an aerial context of the site. And this is the red line of the application showing the actual site location outside the SRC building. And this is our proposed site layout showing the proposed monopole and cabinet. And this is a proposed elevation of the mast, which is 20 metres in height. And this is a view of the site from the front of Glen Dimplex. And this is another view of the site. It's on the Lurgan Road, looking towards down towards Portadown. The arrow actually shows you where the monopole will, is proposed to be located. And this is a view of the site from just up a wee bit from Beaumont Avenue. Again, the arrow shows you the proposed location of the monopole. And the top photograph um, shows you the location of the site from Beaumont Avenue. And the bottom photograph is from Lurgan Road, looking towards Upper Church Lane. And that concludes the presentation. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Roisin. Um, I don't think we have any representations here, have we? And with nobody from the company themselves to answer questions? No. 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 Um, okay, members. So we'll proceed then to questions so I will take any questions for Roisin at this stage I suppose um, I have one been at the um, site visit in terms of the location you know there's no doubt about it it is you know, it's going to be visually impactful in my opinion and just with that and you know looking at the aerial shots there are in my opinion better locations for this to the eye but i know that's maybe not the type of solution that works for phone signal and the principles and, and properties of an antenna and what it's designed to do but you know what were the reasons in specifics given um you know as to why this site is more appropriate than a more elevated site you know, further away from residential properties or closer to the main, um, the main roads there over to the left of that image on the slide. And I suppose those are sort of questions would be good to ask the operators or the proposed operators of this or the developers of it that, you know, would maybe have the technical knowledge to answer them. I know planners have only so much you can know about things like, but um, just I'd appreciate any indication on that. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, you recall at the, the last meeting that the, obviously the operator was, or the agent um, involved in the application was here and he did go through a number of other sites that they had considered and they had pinpointed five sites that they had considered and the reasons that they had had you know, ruled them out. And the reason those sites were being considered was the proximity to where they, they need the coverage, where there is a drop in signal here for, for O2. 
um, they decided to opposite Hillmore Combs there, but they ruled it out because the footpath was considered not wide enough to facilitate uh, the cabinet and the area of clearance for the, the, the doors, etc. required. They had looked at a site in the junction of Lurgan Road with Upper Church Lane. Um, however, it would be set directly outside residential properties and amongst other services. And again, the roadway was felt to be very, or the footpath was felt to be narrow. They had looked at the footpath in front of Birch Hill. Again, they felt the footpath was too narrow. Um, again, it would be in front of existing properties, which is the potential impact on residential amenity. Um, they'd looked lands to the front of Lurgan Senior High. Um, but you know, it was quite a visible on approach. They felt like visually it was less acceptable than this site. And um, there were also concerns that uh, it could impact on the visibility displays for access arrangements. And they had looked at further up the Lurgan Road uh, on the footpath um, as you head back in towards Portadown. But due to the location of overhead NIE cables, the existing street furniture they would be able to achieve, you know, achieve the necessary 20 metres in height. So they had given us a number of locations that they'd looked at and the reasons why they had ruled them out. Yeah, I suppose with, you know, this one just looks like it's right in the middle of a residential zone. And, you know, when I look at other applications around the car, not applications, other installations around the country, I mean, I think of, you know, locally to me, they're up high, they're on agricultural land, quite removed from any residential. And I'm assuming the, you know, the high altitude um, assists with the distribution of the signal. Um, you know, you, you look at this site and it's quite low. It's quite, you know, eye level, if you like, and you just wonder how could it not be advantageous to have it somewhere where there's elevation and, you know, and it's then serving the purpose without all the negative impacts visually and, you know, residential concerns close by. I'm just, you know, that concerns me a wee bit, you know. Thank you, Chair. Yes, well, the information that was provided by the agent was, you know, sort of highlighting that this is where it's, it's high peak demand here. So somewhere, you know, more, you know, in a you know, less residential area or, you know, less busy area won't have the same level of demand, which you won't need the same level of coverage. So what they're saying is there's, you know, there's high peaks of demand within this area, which is largely associated with the various education facilities. And, you know, the existing sales are coming saturated big times, which is having an impact on the wider network. So that's why a sale is needed in this location. So that's why, you know, a more remote site isn't necessarily going to work for, for the provider. Um, you know, I'd also point out that the, the, the planning guidance suggests that place, placing a mass near similar structures will minimise contrast. You know, it suggests that they should be beside industrial commercial premises, pylons, lampposts, which in this case it is beside pylons and lampposts, albeit they're at a, you know, they're, they are smaller, but it is beside, you know, larger premises such as Glen Dimplex and the SRC. Um, you know, the guidance talks about locating a mass within existing groups of trees or planting new trees to help integrate it. Well, we are in an area here where there's quite tall mature trees that will help, help integrate at least, you know, the lower part of the mast. Um, you know, the, the, the guidance talks about trying to keep these to slimline monocles, which are, you know, less visually intrusive than the lattice towers, which they have done here. And again, you know, the, the, it's painted grey to try and, you know, you fit, you know, fit in with the skyline. So in our view that they have complied, tried to comply with the guidance and, you know, they've given us enough information to say like it's needed here and this is why this location is the most suitable. So, so that reckon, reason we're recommending approval. Thanks, Roisin. Councillor Armstrong. Thank you, Chair. I think um, you probably touched on most of the probably queries and questions that I was looking to raise on that, just about the the situation that is placed in and obviously in that with with the height of of this uh, tower um so I, i'll i'll park that for now i know that there's been lots of talks of these towers and non uh i'm going to get this right non iodizing radiation i think i got that right i'm not too sure um there has been concerns that these towers do probably emit some form of radiation. Um, what is the concerns on that in this site? Is there any concerns? And is has all regulatory bodies come back and say that they are content that this this probably won't cause any issues? Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Roshi. Thank you, Chair. Um, in response to your question, yes, issues have been raised through, you know, through objections with regard to the impacts that this will have on, on, on human health. Um, but in terms of health impacts, the proposal has been accompanied by the ICNIRP Declaration of Conformity, and that's required by policy and regional guidance advises that where, you know, where it is accompanied by this declaration, it shouldn't be necessary for the planning authority to consider health concerns any further. Now, you will be aware that the council wrote to DFI in July last year 
just highlighting that regional policy was 20 year old and, and should be reviewed. And obviously they wrote back to us um, and sort of said, like the Department of Health could probably, you know, they, they referred to the SPPS and said the Department of Health could advise further with regard to, you know, proposals of this type of development. Um, officers wrote to the Department of Health and they came back to say that they have a memorandum of understanding with the UK Health Security Agency. They've produced guidance on the health aspects of exposure to electromagnetic fields or radio waves tra transmitted by mobile communication network base stations. The most recent guidance was produced in August 21. The guidance states that health effects are unlikely to occur if exposures are below the international guideline levels. And in summary, many exposure measurements have been made in the UK at publicly available locations near to base stations, and these have been consistently within the ICNIRP guidelines. PPS 10 states that were concerned is raised by the health effects of electromagnetic fields. It's the view of the Department of Health that if the proposed development meets the guidelines of ICNIRP, it's not necessary to consider this aspect further. So we are guided obviously by policy and you know this council has made efforts to write to DFA and to the Department of Health to seek you know further guidance on that matter. So you know for that reason, yes, I understand the concerns of people, but we are we are sort of working within the policy here. And as I say, we have made efforts to try and get a bit more clarity around that matter. Thank you. Councillor Armstrong again. <clears throat> Thank you, Rushing, for that. Um, so, again, we are bound by policy within council, and we have to go by what the most up-to-date uh, information we have is from the departments, and that's all we can really do. So I really appreciate that answer. But uh, I think probably the main concern when we're standing on that site was probably going to be the the impact on sites there. I think that's where I would be drawing my concerns at. 20 metres, we stood beside the, the lamppost and there were 8 metres. This is going to be double that plus. So, and I get the, what we, we said about that. This is was the only sort of ideal situation that the the company had to put it and you went through them in detail and I really appreciate that. But I think that would probably be more where I'd be drawing my concerns at at the moment. If it were happy enough with the health concerns, um, I think... Um, we'll probably probably talk uh, talk about this at a later date um, uh, when we get to the decision point. So, but thank you very much, Oshin. Okay, members, any other discussion points? Right, then move into the debate phase, members. Yeah. So we'll take your views at this point. Councillor Mulholland. Thanks, Chair. Um, one thing I just I would like to ask, um, with regards the installation of these particular towers, has there been any evidence brought forward at all where these towers significantly significantly devalue property that's close to them? Thank you. Thanks, Rowan. We're in the debate phase, but I'll allow that. Question. Yep, thank you, Chair. I have no evidence in front of me that it impacts on property prices. Um, yes, that statement has been made, and you know, we've had statements that people have consulted with the estate agents, but I have nothing. There's no evidence. No, no evidence has been submitted to me to demonstrate that that is the case. Thank you, Roshin. Any other comments, members? Done. Okay, then we'll move to the decision phase. So I'll need a proposal um, on this one. Councillor Donnelly. I propose approval. approval. So we have a proposal um, in favour of the officer recommendation. Do we have anybody to second that, members? Any members? Councillor Armstrong. Yeah, I'll, I'll second that proposal. Okay, members all agreed. Okay, take it the way we are. Not quiet today, folks. We better. Reaction would be useful. 
Agreed. Thank you. Any other? Don't have any other. So, members, that concludes item one. So I will relinquish the chair and we'll get our uh, chairman back in position. Thank you. Thank you very much, members, and thank you very much, Alderman Wilson, for taking over Appendix 1. Okay, moving on to uh, Appendix 3, Application Number LA08-2018-1248F, and it's time for an approval. Uh, Roisin Hamill, Principal Planning Officer, is to present the report on PowerPoint presentation. Where's Roisin? I'll be saying right here. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Over to yourself, Roisin. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. This application seeks full planning permission for the erection of four dwellings and associated works on lands immediately southeast of 45 Corrigan Hill Road, Dungannon. The application is being presented to committee as it attracts objections from more than four postal addresses. The application site lies within the development limits of college lands and is not zoned for any use. Officers are of the opinion that the proposal to develop the site for residential purposes does not conflict with the Armagh area plan and is acceptable in principle. Policy QD1 of PPS7 requires new residential development to demonstrate that the proposal will create a quality and sustainable environment. Policy QD1 identifies nine criteria which proposals for residential development are expected to comply with. These have been considered in detail in the report and as set out, officers are of the opinion that the proposed development is acceptable such that it complies with the SPPS Policy QD1 of PPS7 and its addendum and the supplementary planning guidance as detailed in creating places. Members are advised the application was accompanied by a concept master plan, a biodiversity checklist, a preliminary risk assessment and odour and noise impact assessments. Officers have considered the application against the area plan and the prevailing plan and policies and are of the opinion the proposal is acceptable. Members are advised there are a number of objections in relation to the proposal which have been detailed in the report. The issues raised relate primarily to potential impact on the future running and expansion of the nearby factories, the potential impact of these factories on the proposed dwellings through noise and odour, the scale and character of the proposal, traffic generation and road safety, potential for overlooking loss of light and privacy. Officers acknowledge that while there are four factories within the settlement limits of college land and that the site is potentially to be adversely impacted by two of these factories by reason of noise, officers in consultation with the Environmental Health Department are satisfied that subject to the proposed mitigation measures as set out in the report, the amenity of prospective residents will be protected from unacceptable adverse noise levels. Officers have considered all of the objections in detail and are of the opinion that the objections raised do not warrant a refusal. 
In addition to the letters of objection, three letters of support were received, including from the local primary school and the local parish priest. On balance, officers are of the opinion that the proposal accords with the area plan, the SPPS and other relevant policies, and officers recommend that members grant plan and permission subject to the conditions set out in the report. And I'll just take you through the slides. And the blue area, the blue arrow just shows you where the site is uh, in the in the area in College Land Settlement. And this is a site location plan that's been submitted with the application with the application site outlined in red. And this is an aerial photograph of the site. You can see there's a factory to the north and a factory further to the south. And this is a settlement limit of college lands and an aerial photograph of the site, a site again within the wider area. So this is a photograph of the site taken from Corrigal Head Road, looking southeast towards number 45. The blue arrow will show you where the photographs are taken from. <coughs> and this is a photograph taken from Corrigal Hill Road, looking northwest into the site towards number 45. So the site's just to the right there. And again, this photograph taken from Corrigal Hill Road, looking northeast into the site. And this photograph is taken from the front of the site, looking towards the boundary with number 45. And this is a photograph taken from outside number 36, Corrigan Hill Road, looking towards northwest along the site frontage, which is the right hand side. And a photograph taken from outside number 36, Corrigan Hill Road, and the site's on the left hand side. And a photograph taken from Corrigan Hill, looking towards the southeast um, from the outbuildings adjacent to number 31. And this is a satellite image showing the site in relation to existing factories and landmarks. So this is the story and a half dwelling, this is house type A. And this is the proposed house type B. Proposed house type C. And proposed house type D. And this is cross sections through the site. And this is details of the, the pier, wall, and the fencing details that are proposed within the site. And this is our proposed site layout. So you can see our, our four dwellings fronting onto the Corrigan Hill Road. And that ends the presentation. Okay, thank you very much, Hushin. Members, we have Mr. John Mackel. Can you just really, ah, there you are, John uh, and Martin. De, uh, sorry, John Michael from Michael Pet Foods and Martin Lester from Lester Acoustics. Very much welcome, gentlemen. We also have Andy Stevens from Matrix Planning and John Lavery from Laid Consulting, uh, Mark McNeese from Armad Design, and Connor Curran, who's the applicant to make representation in support of the application. So uh, we're going to go with. John, Mr. Michael, and Mr. Lester, you have three minutes to make representation. Okay, so whenever, whenever you start, the, the clock will start. Okay, so over to yourselves. Good evening, members. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to address you this evening. I am John Mackle, the Managing Director of Mackle Pet Foods, and I'm also here on behalf of Mackle Apple. Our family companies have both been in college land for over 50 years, and together we employ over 300 staff, contributing in excess of £9 million annually in salaries to the local community. We are not anti-development and recognise the need for additional houses in college land. However, we are strongly opposed to the proposed development as we believe that it is incompatible with our existing operations. The Council and ourselves have had to respond to numerous complaints from neighbours regarding noise and nuisance in recent years. And we believe that if this development is approved, it will put at risk the future of our companies. At Michael Pet Foods, we have invested £15 million over the last 10 years to grow and develop, and are currently in the middle of a further £12 million investment, which is due to be completed at the end of this year. If this development is approved, 
we will have no alternative but to stop all future investment at this location. And there is a very strong possibility this will result in significant job losses due to the relocation of the business from the area. Given the threat that this application has to, our, has to the operations of our established businesses and local employment in the area, we respectfully re request that members refuse the application or alternatively defer the decision for a site visit to fully understand the context of the application. Failure to do so will leave us with no choice but to seek legal advice on, on the options available to pursue judicial proceedings. Thank you for your time. Proposed condition eight of the council's document appendix eight should refer to drawing 11F, not drawing 11E. Condition nine of the council's document appendix eight should state that both the window and ventilation systems are required to provide a sound reduction performance of 26 dB RW plus CTR or greater. The inform informative requested by Environmental Health on the 11th of Jan 2024 does not appear to be included in the case officer re officer's report. In terms of the barrier insertion loss that will be provided by the proposed acoustic barrier for the private community areas, I don't believe that there have been any cross sections or calculations to support the Matlonian consulting claim that a 10 dBA reduction will be provided by a 2.2 metre high barrier. And on the penultimate page of the Council's document, Appendix 8, it's PDF pages 22 of 24, it notes that additional plans were submitted, drawing 11F received on the 18th May 2021, which have been amended to ensure that the acoustic barrier abuts the dwellings. My interpretation of drawing 11F is that the barrier abuts the footpath around the house, not the dwelling. Thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I'm going to main piece begin. Okay, that's Mark, is it? Uh, no problem. Andy, go ahead and bring yourself in here. Yeah. Go ahead, Andy, whenever your time goes, it's three minutes. Okay, thank you. Chair, members, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak in support of the officer's recommendation to grant planning permission. I'm Andy Stevens of Matrix Planning. I'm joined by Mark McNeese, the project architect, who can outline the uh, local benefits, and John Lavery, acoustic consultant. The proposal seeks four high-quality dwellings within the settlement of college lands close to the existing community facilities where there's a clear need for family homes for local people. Whilst the application has been in the system for some time, this is a reflection of the detailed deliberation by both planning officers and environmental health department who have been consulted on five separate occasions to ensure the assessment and recommendation before you is comprehensive and robust. The 23-page committee report before you is balanced, fair, and provides an excellent chronology and process history of this case. It confirms the proposal is compliant with all aspects of the local development plan, prevailing planning policy, and there are no objections from any of the statutory consultees to the proposal on the grounds of traffic, biodiversity, environmental impact, drainage, and most importantly, residential amenity. The proposal constitutes sustainable development. Whilst there have been commercial objections, as you have heard, it is not an unusual circumstance to have housing adjacent or in proximity to existing industry, so long as mitigation measures are utilised. I note that none of the objectors or objections dispute the fact that mitigation can address the concerns. Whilst each site is considered on its own merits, there are numerous other case examples in the borough and in Northern Ireland which reinforce the approach adopted by officers and environmental health as the correct one. The third party concerns are predicated on a generalised fear of harm, but there is no clear evidence of harm being demonstrated in place before you, which is the policy test. The objectors are inviting you to misinterpret policy PD8 and the SPPS and wrongly attach weight to a hypothetical situation uh, as there is no quantifiable investment project before you, which would be jeopardised if this development was granted permission and proceeded. Nor is there any evidence of future harm to residents, taking account of the mitigation measures proposed and the fact that the expansions to the factory are in the opposite direction. The recently constructed dwellings at Trinity Lane by the applicant, beside James Michael Apples, only serve to further undermine the objector's points and demonstrate there are no issues of incompatibility or complaints where housing is located beside industry in the immediate locality and when using appropriate mitigation. Planning decisions can only be taken in an evidential context, and I have a, the report of the last complaint, which was in 2021, um, so there's no recent complaints. 
and all the evidence, including the responses of Environmental Health Department, would indicate that there is a lack of any sustainable objections to the proposal. We fully support the positive recommendation before members and would respectfully ask you as a committee to endorse the grant of planning permission for this high quality residential development that provides family homes for local people. And maybe Mark, if he has a bit of time, can go through the benefits and questions. Thank you for your time. Give it 10 seconds, Mark, if you want to take them up. <laughs> Some of the benefits that spring to mind. Sorry. Some of the benefits that spring to mind would be the. I think it was about. I'll give a go for the benefit of twelve seconds because you sort of went off at ten. Okay, so we'll give you twelve seconds. Sure. So with the whenever, white... whenever it comes up here yeah. on the screen, you can. Take a minute. It's just to be fair. So we have the widening of uh, Oregon Hill Road, especially as a single unclassified carriageway. Um, we also have the, on the wider concept plan, you'll note the pedestrian path, which in time will link with the, with the Oregon Hill Road with Trinity Lane and the wider car. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, members. And thank you for that, because it's just given you the proper time, OK? Um, Okay, members, over to yourselves, we're going to bring in Alderman Wilson for questions. Okay, over to yourself, Alderman. Uh, yeah, thank you. That's just a point. Um, I always like to go to Google Maps when I'm looking at sites because you can zoom away and, you know, it's just a better package. But I'm just wondering, why is Trinity Lane not mentioned? Because on Google Maps, it's very clear you've one, two, three, four, five, you've six houses already constructed on a roadway down into what I assume is the wider site. Is that the correct, is that, am I looking at the right space? Because it's hard to just rationalize it when you're looking at the screen grab. But on 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 Google Maps, as on my machine here, it's showing a number of houses already um, constructed. But the map that's the aerial photograph of the site has none of that. I'm just wondering why we're not using the up to date one. Uh, apologies, um, Alderman. It's maybe an old map that we just had transcribed from an old. This we we'd intended to present this to committee before a couple of years ago. So it's maybe an old map that we've transcribed from a presentation that was done back then and it just hasn't been updated. But it is mentioned in the report, you know, it is taken into account that there is housing up at the, the north end of the field and, you know, it's considered in terms of density, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it has been taken into account. Yeah, and just to, just to further tease that out, is it the same, you know, is this part of the same development, if you like, only starting in a, a different location or is there any connection at all? Just just to have that on the minute. I think it's useful to, to have that. And also, when that original application was approved, what was the level of objection, if any, to that, you know, to those, those number of houses that are shown as constructed on the on my Google image? Thank you, Chair. I believe the original application went through delegated procedures, so the level of objection would have been less than four, and Trudy might be able, sorry, Trudy might be able to clarify that for me. Thank you, Chair. Um, the previous application, Alderman Wilson, actually came through committee early part of COVID, if I remember rightly. Um, it was 2018-1084 and had a similar level of objection to this application, um, albeit maybe slightly fewer because there's more residential properties along Corrigan Hill than there was on the College of Lands Road end. Um, the other question that you had about the map, we actually tend to use spatial NI for the map because it tends to be slightly clearer for you. So I'm actually just checking it now to see whether Trinity lands on it for you, but um, 
So maybe just a wee bit of clarity on that as well. Thank you. Okay, members, just alluded to there, we've also Kevin McGillough, Clay Shanks, and then we have Paul McCullough, who's environmental health manager. Okay, so if there's any questions there. Any other questions, members? Yep. Yeah. Uh, Paul, not letting you off lately. There was a query there, or uh, there was mention of the 11th of January regarding a complaint. Uh, I think that was this year. Can you elaborate on that? Do you know anything about that complaint from the 11th of January that was that was made by the objectors? Chair, sure, I'm not sure what complaint we're referring to, to be honest. I ask the objectors to sort of elaborate then on what the complaint was, please. It, it's the fact that in the environmental health consultation response of dated the 11th of January, they pr proposed two conditions and an informative, and the informative hasn't been carried through into Appendix 8. Um, the informative basically suggests it is the Clean Neighbourhoods and Environment Act, NI 2020, 2011, says the applicant and future occupants should be aware of the proposed that the proposed, proposed development is located in close proximity to existing industrial premises, including a pet food and an apple factory, which are operational both day and night. Such industrial uses are likely to give rise to some adverse, impacts, uh, adverse impacts due to noise, dust, traffic and odours from time to time. And it's that statement that I think would be useful to be in a planning approval if that went if it goes down that line for proposed or put. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. I'm going to bring in Roisin so we give us a wee bit of an update on. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's normal practice when we're presenting applications to planning committee that we would include the proposed conditions that we had attached to any planning decision. We don't normally attach the informatives that we would attach to a planning decision, and, and this would be an informative. It's not actually a condition. It's a, a planning informative, and sometimes informatives can be very lengthy, and it would lengthen all of the reports that we present to the planning committee where we to attach every informative that we would intend to attach. If members are minded to approve this, on the basis of the, the comments from environmental health, it's something that we would would attach to a decision notice as an informative. Yep. Okay, members, over to yourselves. Any more questions or comments? Okay, moving on to debate. Any comments to make? No. Okay. Move on to decision. Can I get a proposal? or a seconder proposed by Councillor Hockey for the recommendation and seconded by Councillor O'Dowd for the recommendation. Are we all agreed, members? All agreed? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Okay, okay members, move on to Appendix 4. Okay, members, moving on to Appendix 4, application number LA082119-0057FA. Uh, and it's time for an approval. There's also an addendum report has been circulated. I'm going to bring in Trudy Chapman, Senior Planning Officer, to present report on PowerPoint presentation. Yeah, over to yourself, Trudy. Thank you, Chair. Members, the report and the addendum has been circulated in advance of the meeting. 
but by way of summary, the application is before you this evening as objections have been received from more than four postal addresses. In addition to this, officers would like to add another condition, which would read, the construction of the development approved herein shall not commence until landscape management and maintenance plan has been sub submitted to and approved by the council in writing. The plan shall set out the period of the plan, long-term objectives, management responsibilities and maintenance schedules of all areas of landscaping as shown on drawing number D06 revision R. It shall also set out the details of the arrangements that will be put in place for future management and maintenance in perpetuity of these areas, including details of any legal agreement before the between the prospective residents and management company, which are to be put in place as per policy OS2 of PPS8. The landscape management and maintenance plan should be carried out as approved. And the reason for this is to ensure the successful establishment and ongoing management and maintenance in perpetuity of the landscaping in the interests of visual and residential amenity. The application relates to the erection of 22 dwellings and 21 garages on land within the settlement limit of Milford, on land which is not zoned for any particular use. Officers are of the opinion that the proposal to develop the site for residential purposes does not conflict with the Arma area plan and is acceptable in principle. Policy QD1 of PPS7 requires new residential development to demonstrate the proposal will create a quality and sustainable environment. Policy QD1 identifies nine criteria which proposals for residential development are expected to comply with. These have been considered in detail in the report as set out. Officers are of the opinion that the proposed development is acceptable, such that it complies with the SPPS, Policy QD1 of PPS7 and its addendum, and all supplementary guidance as detailed in creating places. Members are advised that the application was accompanied by a concept plan, plan and support and statement, parking statement, transport assessment form, a drainage assessment, a wastewater impact solution report, and farm maps. Officers have considered the application against the area plan and the prevailing planning policies, and are of the opinion that the proposal is acceptable. Members are advised that issues relating to access, traffic and wastewater infrastructure were raised by consultees during the processing of the application, and that amendments and additional information were submitted to address these concerns. Members are advised that there were a number of objections in relation to the proposal, which can be summarised as the scale, character of the proposal, impact on the character of Milford, impact on built and natural heritage, loss of green space, traffic generation, parking and road safety, potential for overlooking and loss of light and privacy. Officers have considered these objections in detail in the report that's been circulated and are of the opinion that the objections raised do not warrant a refusal. I can advise that the consultation responses were all favourable and officers are of the opinion that the proposal accords with the relevant policies. Officers therefore recommend that members grant planning permission subject to the conditions set out in the report and I'll just take you through the PowerPoint please. So that's our location within the general area. Our site location plan. This is an aerial photograph of the site within the wider area. And you can just see to the right hand side of that, that's actually the tail end of our mass city. So we're just outside our mass city, our city um, development limit. Next slide, please. So that's um, us a bit closer. And our site is the green area um, sandwiched between the two roads to the center of the, the slide. The next slide, please. So these photographs are taken from the Monaghan Road. Um, the easiest way to, to sort of direct you is that the building to the centre is Milford Orange Hall. So in the top photo, it's from the Orange Hall left is the site. And then the bottom one is showing you um, the sort of context with Milford Orange Hall. And you can see the Milford Christian Fellowship just in the background. It gives you a bit of a, a guide if you're used to travelling along that road. Um, hopefully the slides are done in a way that we're going to go from one way around the site to the other way. So the next slide then should, please Paula, is further down Monaghan Street. Again, you can see the Orange Hall, the top slide to your right, give you a, a bit of a focal point. And then working your way down to the, the other end of the site, which has the small agricultural building. Uh, the two photos at the bottom are taken from just different stretches along the Monaghan Road. Next slide, please. So at this point, um, we're on Hill Street looking towards 1A that forms part of the application site and we're looking at the junction looking into Monaghan Street. Next slide, please. Now at this point, we've moved into the junction. The top one is from Monaghan Street looking back out onto Hill Street and the bottom one is just inside Monaghan Street looking down um, Monaghan Street with the site would be on our right. Next slide, please. 
this point we've moved slightly further along the road and this is us looking towards the site with number 1A is the, the house that you can see just behind the fence there. Next slide, please. So this is showing the boundary with 1A and the buildings um, within the cartilage of 1A. The two buildings to the front of the lower um, picture are to be demolished as part of this application. Um, and then uh, the two other houses that front out onto Hill Street will go in, in place of those. Next slide, please. So this is from the top end of the, the site looking down. So we've got the boundary with 1A um, and then as you can see the existing uh, agricultural building and that's us looking down to the terraced houses on Monaghan Street. Next slide please. So this is taken from the other end. Again you've got the orange hall in the top photograph as, as your focal point and then looking back towards the junction with Hill Street with the houses on Monaghan Street on your right. Next slide please. So this is taken from the turning circle in front of the Christian Fellowship building. Um, this shows you that there is a level difference across the site. It, it looks more extreme in those photographs than it does, as you've seen, as you work your way around. But there is a, about a 4.7 metre difference from the highest point to the lowest point. But that's over quite a significant distance. Um, and it also shows you sort of the, the boundaries of the site at that point that are, are currently ranch fencing. Next slide, please. Now this, this is taken from the Christian Fellowship uh, car park looking back and it gives you a context of the existing development in the area. So on the right hand side we've got the, the newer houses of Manor Hill and then we've got the existing historic buildings of Monaghan Street and the Orange Hall uh, and the site then just to the left of that. The next slide please. This is um, house type A and B. Next slide please. House type C and the next. This is D and A, and the next, this is A1, B1, next one should be garages, our cross sections, our contextual elevations, which show what the development will look like from both the uh, Monaghan Street and Monaghan Road views. And the next one, please. That's our proposed landscape, and as you'll see, there's trees and um, hedges to be all along all main uh, Boundary definitions. Our next slide, please. And that's our proposed layout, which might be the last one. Nope. PSD drones. The red indicates the area to be adopted. And that should be the last one. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Trudy. Uh, members, we have Mr. Paul Painter, yes, uh, who's the applicant to make representation in support of the applicant, and Mr. Michael Rogers, who's the agent who's here for speaking rights and clarification purposes. So, again, Paul, you have three minutes. Um, whenever you start, the clock will start, okay? Yep, so over to yourself. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Committee. <clears throat> The Painter family have had strong connections with the village of Milford for nearly 50 years. I was raised there and would only want to seek its prosperity. We have owned land within the development limit of Milford since the 1980s. However, in 2018, it was decided that I would make a planning application so there could be influence over the design and build process of any development on this land. My aspiration was to provide homes, not just houses. After I submitted the first draft of this application, I asked Milford Community Development Association to arrange a public meeting so I could present the proposals. The then chair of MCDA, sadly now deceased, included the following in a letter after that meeting, which is posted on the planning portal. He said, as a committee, we are very appreciative of the consultations with Paul and wish that all developers were accommodating. At that time, I was advised my application may take six months to process. That was five years ago. Since then, there have been various consultations related to the application. My agents have provided a lot of additional information and clarification, and several changes to the original proposals have been made. A wastewater impact assessment has been agreed with Northern Ireland Water. I acknowledge there are objectors to this application. Some have been local and some are not. And one anonymous commentator has been, let's say, fastidious in raising questions. 
However, with each of the neighbour notifications, the number of objectors has declined. Some local stakeholders in the Monmouthon Street area even switched from object to support. We can all now be assured that the proposals before this committee today for your approval have been thoroughly tested and comply with all planning policies. To Milford residents, I say this, this land is within the development limit. Someone was going to build on it, and I have taken the responsibility to make sure any development is done well. There are many local people who do not object. For some, this is because they would like to have the opportunity of living in a new home in a new development in Milford. How do I know this? Some of them contacted me only weeks ago to say so. Finally, according to a recent NISRA report, I quote, house building in Northern Ireland fell to a 60 year low in 2023. These proposals are only a drop of provision in an ocean of need when it comes to building essential homes, but they are something towards that end. Therefore, I commend my planning application to you for your formal approval. Thank you very much, Paul, for that. Okay, members, Paul's in your court. Uh, can you open the proceedings? Okay. Any questions? Okay, no questions. Okay, any comments? Move on to debate. Any comments? Yes. No. Councillor O'Dowd, please. <clears throat> It's just it's just fun going down the plans there. Um this might sound irrelevant to some people, but living in a development I know and sounds silly, but I don't see anything the the plans look great. Brilliant, but I don't see any um uh measures for slowing down or anything if families are going to be living in that area. We've dealt with issues, I've dealt with loads of issues, new developments where there is no traffic camming measures within them. And that would be one of my main things. And I'll bring that up at every new plan. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. She crossed the minister. Okay. Do you want to comment on that? <laughs> <laughs> Paul, do you want to, or the agent, do you want to comment on that, please? Thank you. Yes. Um, Monaghan Street is a very slow moving street. It's a, it's a very modest street. We take two very short cul de sacs off that. They're by their, by their nature, they're very, very slow. The traffic will be, I would say, traffic speeds, but on that below, you know, below 20 miles an hour, you know. But, those cul-de-sacs are naturally where kids play and traffic moves very, very slowly. I wouldn't anticipate any any issues of any danger there at all. Yeah, back in Councillor Dayden and Alderman Wilson. Thanks, Chair. But you yourself don't know the anybody that's going to be moving into these houses, so you can't say if they're going to speed, if they're not going to speed one thing or another. So I think to have a measure in there would be very good for the families. Are you happy to comment on this one, DFI? <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Yep, happy to comment. Um, Monaghan Street uh, already has some level of traffic calming on it. There are two speed tables either side of the two cul-de-sacs that are being proposed. Uh, the cul-de-sacs that are designed are designed as shared surface roads, and the length of each cul-de-sac isn't long enough to uh, require the imposition of any further speed control measure. They meet the design criteria set out in creating places. Um, as far as uh, who moves into the houses, we've, we've no way of telling what behaviour those people will 
uh, you know, we can't stop people speeding. We can't legislate for people who don't obey the rules. Thank you very much, David. Uh, I'll bring in Alderman Wilson there and we'll come back. No, you happy enough? Okay, go ahead, Councillor. Go ahead, Councillor Dad. Thanks. Um, but you could put a measure in to prevent it. Because there's like, what is the distance, sorry, on this scale from the entrance of the estate to that cul de sac? Fifty four meters. At the one. Yes, on, on under the, the terms of creating places design guide on a shared surface road, you should have speed uh, control measures uh, every 40 metres. But the 40 metres is measured then back 15 metres from the end of the cul-de-sac. So it's within that uh, remit, in, in, up to 55 metres and around 55 metres. They're flexibly interpreted in that. Yeah. So it's not a, a long enough cul-de-sac to warrant the imposition of another speed control feature. Another speed control feature could, of course, be put in, but it's not deemed necessary under the design criteria. Okay. Thank you very much, David. Thank you very much, Councillor. And Alderman Wilson, please. Yeah, it's just one for Mr. Painter. I just noticed with the, you know, zooming in on some of the, the design cues on the proposed houses, has there been a sort of a conscientious effort to sort of mirror what's existing and I know there of a time period and a, of an architectural sort of merit that would probably be difficult to replicate in this day and be be quite costly but I do note some of the style and cues and the is there like a, a, a yellowy render going to be applied or some type of sandstone archways and some of the doors to note is that to sort of give a nod to you know the existing heritage of the area there's one building in Milford and it was decided it's kind of a, a gothic style that we would incorporate some of those archers to match in with that. And there's an inclusion of some brick to tie in with the existing houses on Monathan Street. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, members. Any more questions? Can we move on to debate? Any comments? Councillor Armstrong. Thank you, Chair, um, for letting me uh, comment on this here. It's it's not too often when we come to plan an application that the, the work's probably already done, that they've consulted with the local church and the local Orange Lodge and, and then the local community group, and, and the work has been done on the ground. He says he's waiting five years now to get to this point, so I think the work has been done um, they have thought of pretty much everything uh, with 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 the designs of, of the properties as well to nod to the heritage of Milford. I think these these houses probably would be a good addition. So look, I, I, at this moment, I'm welcome to see it. So thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Councillor and Alderman Kennedy. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Milford is a very prosperous wee area getting into it, it has been really updated in the last few years and, and I take it the uh, chair of the community was Stephen that you're talking about and, and I'd say Stephen would be very proud of a bit of further development in Milford he was really really an enthusiast about Milford so I think it'd be welcome as well okay, Thank you very much Sullivan Kelly no other comments okay, I'm going to move on to Decision. Okay, can I get a proposer or seconder for uh, of sorts? Alderman Kennedy, please. And uh, I'll be proposed to accept the officer's recommendation. And can we have a seconder? Second by Alderman Wilson. Okay, we all agreed. Great. Okay, thank you very much, members. Thank you very much. Okay. Move on to Appendix 5.
Okay, members appendix five, application number LA08, 2023, 1944F, on a stand for an approval on Roisin Hamill, Principal Planning Officers, to present report on PowerPoint presentation over yourself, Roisin. Thank you, Chair. This application seeks full planning permission for the erection of a single story dwelling and garage to include new access from existing laneway and associated landscaping on lands adjacent to and 70 metres southeast of 32 Nocknamuckley Lane. Avon. The application is being presented to committee as it attracts objections from more than four postal addresses. The application site lies in the open countryside as defined by the Craig Avon area plan. There are no specific policies in the plan relevant to the proposed development, therefore the application is considered under the operational policies of the SPPS and PPS 21. Policy CTY2A new dwellings and existing clusters of PPS 21 states the planning permission will be granted for a dwelling at an existing cluster provided that all of the six criteria listed within the policy have been met. Officers consider each of these criteria have been set out in detail in the report and officers consider the proposal complies with each of the criteria, therefore the proposed development complies with CTY2A of PPS 21. In terms of the design, the proposed dwelling is a detached single storey finished in smooth render with stone elements and slate roof. The dwelling will have a ridge height of 5.2 metres and is decided to form a courtyard style layout. Officers are satisfied the proposed development will be in keeping with the settlement pattern and character of the area. Officers are content there is a sufficient separation distance from adjacent dwellings to avoid loss of amenity and the proposal includes additional planting to further screen the development from existing dwellings. Officers consider there will be no adverse impact on the residential community of, of, of adjacent neighbouring properties by reason of loss of light, overlooking, overshadowing or loss of privacy. The proposal will involve non-main sewage disposal and the applicant has stated the proposed dwelling will be served by a package treatment plant. Officers are satisfied there is sufficient space within the site to accommodate the plant, the details of which will be submitted for approval. The proposal seeks to retain all boundaries so there will be no unacceptable adverse impact on priority species or habitat. The statement also highlights that trees are scattered along the site boundaries are to be retained. Officers consider the proposal complies with all relevant policies and guidance and recommend the plan of permission should be granted subject to the conditions listed within the report. And I'll just take you through the slides. And the red arrow just gives you an idea of where the site is in the, the local area. And this is an aerial context of the site. You can see our application site is outlined in red with the access out onto Nocknamuckley Lane. This is the site location plan that has been submitted with the application. Uh, this slide shows you to uh, an extract from the guidance document building on tradition to the left hand side, which is an example of what a cluster of development, uh, a site that complies with CTY2A would look like. And then on the right hand side, it shows you our site on Nocknamuckley Lane. And this is a slide just depicting where the cluster of development is, just there at the crossroads with Nocknamuckley Lane, Knock Road. And this is our proposed site layout. You can see it is it's a single story dwelling which is formed in a courtyard shape. These are the proposed elevations. The top is the view to the new two, two story dwelling to the front of the road. And the, view, the second bottom view is the view to number 35. And the slide shows the view towards the existing shed and the bottom view is the view towards numbers 44 and 46 Knock Road. And that's just the, the floor plan of the proposed dwelling. And these are computer generated images of the proposed dwelling that have been submitted in support of the application. And the black dots just give you an indication of where the objections are from. And this is a view uh, looking up towards the crossroads um, on the Knock Road from the Orange Hall. And this is a view from the crossroads on the Knock Road and the red arrow gives you an indication of where the proposed site is. And again, this is another view from the crossroads just showing you the location of the proposed site. This is a view from Knock and Muckley Lane. Um, this is the access into the proposed site. And this is a view in the opposite direction looking out, out from the application site towards Knock and Muckley Lane. This is a view from the north end of the site looking down towards Knock Road. And another view of the site just at the end of the access point. And this is a view into the site um, from the north end of the site. 
and that concludes the presentation. Thank you, Trish. Yeah, thank you very much, Roisin. And big welcomes to Carl Lockhart, MP. Very much welcome. And Councillor Julie Flaherty. Very much welcome. Ladies, we also have our sorry, Carla, you are here to make representation and objection. You have five minutes and Councillor Flaherty, you have uh, five minutes to make representation and support. We also have Andre Norville and Stephanie you Pritchard to make representation and objection. The application she have three minutes and she like curtain off to plan ni to make representation as the agent in support of the application okay so the elected representatives have five minutes everybody else have three okay so carla you're first up okay so whenever you start the clock will start okay and in five minutes i will cut you off thank you Chairman, and can I thank the committee for their time this evening. I'm speaking tonight on the part of the objectors. And unfortunately, we find ourselves again in a situation where Knocknamuckley Lane is becoming what looks like a small village. What once was a small farm holding, which for many years serviced the area from an agri perspective, is now a cul-de-sac or a development. It has three houses already built, one having an associated garage, an ongoing appeal for a replacement dwelling and the application before us this evening. So just to recap, this applicant bought what used to be a small farm. Upon purchase, it was divided into seven small plots. And unfortunately, as is the case throughout the countryside, it has been turned into a building development with several applications having been submitted. Permission of two infill sites has been granted. Both have been built, one sold, the other is completed, and a replacement site to build a house substantially off-site was granted. On granting the replacement dwelling, it was permitted to be significantly moved from its original location and now is nowhere near its original footprint. All of these have been built on this small plot of land. There's also an ongoing appeal with regards to a previous application refused by ABC Council, where the same applicant is wanting to relocate again substantially off-site an old stone building. Uh, his reason for relocating substantially off-site as being the cartilage being too restricted. But this is because there are already two infill sites, a garage, which, uh, as is my understanding at the time of building, did not have planning permission. And this site, uh, where he wants this dwelling tonight, is uh, the next closest site to the old stone building, which is subject to appeal. I therefore would respectfully ask that the committee consider awaiting the outcome of the appeal of the planning uh, appeals decision to uphold council's decision as it has uh, an impact on this application. Ultimately, this is the fifth application submitted for a house in what is a rural small holding. This flies in the face of protecting the countryside. This, we believe, is a time for the committee to recognise that the character and morality of the area is being eroded and it flies in the face of everything we do on a daily basis to protect our countryside from build-up or overpopulating. With regards to the application, there are a number of issues I believe should be considered by the committee, namely that of services. And when I speak of services, I refer to there being no public sewer. There's a problem already on the ground with no seepage given the clay ground. I would ask uh, how can such a concentration of houses not require an adequate sewage system? There's no evidence of drainage assessments. There's been no testing of the planned discharge drain as to the capacity and the description of drainage where there is to be a wastewater treatment with discharge to be via surface irrigation to an existing open drain with no permission having been requested from numbers 46, 48 or 50 Knock Road, the houses in the main who will be impacted if there is a, a problem. Overlooking issues, this application is causing significant overlooking issues, particularly for uh, the residents I, I uh, spoke of earlier. Uh, it is impacting their private amenity and there is no condition regarding vegetation. The size and scale of the proposed dwelling is certainly not in keeping with the local area where most houses are of a cottage style, um, particularly the older dwellings. The application is significantly uh, impacting the rural, rural character of the area and whilst planners look at each application in its own right, building a cul-de-sac or a housing development in the countryside is morally wrong. 
many of the residents objecting love their homes. They love the area because they wanted to live in the countryside, not in a built up area. And I believe this is riding over uh, roughshod over residents who've been there many, many years. Additionally, we would question the distances listed in the planning application and uh, the objectors will outline in more detail their concerns. I would ask that the committee consider all of these points and have regard to the rural nature of this site and the fact that this is overpopulating and building out a small rural holding. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Carla. And Councillor Flaherty, over to yourself. Again, you have five minutes. And once you start talking, the, the clock will start. And again, if you hit your five minutes, I'll turn the clock off. Okay, so over to yourself. Thank you very much, uh, Chair and, and members of the committee um, for taking the time um, to allow us to speak here this evening. Um, and I speak here in support of this plan, this application, um, and the... Uh, I hope that we see round agreement here in the chamber after reading such a, a detailed report. I want to thank the officers involved in bringing this application finally to this committee for full approval um, of a beautiful single storey dwelling, which will make a beautiful family home in, in a beautiful part of the world that I know very, very well. It is very welcoming to all families um, and uh, will this will add greatly um, to the family character of the area. The young families are particularly welcome. A long dedicated report has been prepared and is in front of you. You've taken good time, officers. You've taken good time with the planners. Um, as, as you can see, the detailed report before you outlines that all is well within planning policy, as is outlined. All conditions have been met. Plenty of conditions have been put on. Varied conditions have been put on in place as per the application. Um, there's a number of disagreements I, I could make there about it being a cul-de-sac. There's a few issues there have been already addressed in the report regarding the sewage. They're all private there. I must say that as decision makers here in front of me, Mary, um, I'm of the understanding that the decision is not to be dealing with the plan and history in this area. It is a, this very application that is in front of us. Planning history is not what we're here to discuss. I think the time is well passed here to build a detailed report. I'm happy to propose this. I hope that you will seek, you will also agree to an approval of this plan. I'd like to you speak. I'm happy enough. Yeah, thank you very much, Councillor Fardy. And I'm going to bring in Mr. Andrew Norville and Stephanie Pritchard. Um, are you both speaking or is just Andre? Okay, no problem. So give me two seconds. Yes, yeah, so Andre, you have three minutes. Okay, whenever you start, the clock will start. Okay, over to yourself. Okay, uh, thank you everybody for welcoming us here today. Um, thank you to Carla for all her good words. I want to start off with the cluster, um, what it's referring to. Us as residents, where does this stop? That has to be the question. We're now seeing more and more building on top of us. Where does it stop? There's now a ring and now a proposed inner ring in this area, not in line with countryside development in this area. Another house has recently been passed beside the Orange Hall with only one objection, the proposer of this development. I think that says everything. We want to go to residential immunity, the site, neighbouring properties, may be adversely impacted the vegetation along the boundary. These houses are sold on. Neighbouring property needs to have the boundary retained. The trees at the moment are all digitous trees. So from November to April, there is no boundary and the houses they can see straight in. Um, current house being built in 40 Knock, in, in Knock Lane, uh, as well as this, has not objected because it has been left being built late. Nobody's in the house. Closest house to it can't object because it hasn't been built yet and it's been done that for a reason. The other house, number 50, hasn't objected. 
Councillor Flaherty said she knew it well. It was because it was her sister's house. It was her sister's house, as I said. And further than that, her boyfriend was the architect. Also, the other person didn't object is at the end of the road, because he's also looking plan and permission. But every, every other house around it has objected. Size of the house, we talked about the size of the house compared to 46 at Old Bungalow. Stephanie and her husband has been there for 32 years in her family home. She has now been overpowered by two houses. They were saying the proposed dwelling in the notes is a modest house, a modest house of 250 square metres. In this day and age, is that a modest house? I personally don't think so. How can that be described as a modest home? And we're talking about privacy. Um, sorry, there's photographs come up there. We're talking about photographs. There's no photographs of further up the orange hall or from in between 42 and 40 at Knock Road where it's visible. So just to summarize in this, it's a real, real area. It's been impacted by overdevelopment. Not people looking to build their forever family home and be part of the community. To build and sell a business, make money and run. This application may tick boxes for planning, but it's not being realistic. Uh, using the experts to find every loophole possible. Uh, the area should be apple orchards and farming, so supported as such. The Orange Hall has been talked about as a community hub. The hall looks to be this application. Seven years and I've never been invited. Okay, thank you very much, Andre. Uh, thank you. And I'm going to bring in Sheila Curtin uh, to make representation as the agent in support of the application. Sheila, welcome. And uh, you have three minutes to uh, speak. Okay, whenever you start, the clock will start again. Okay. Over to yourself. Chairperson and committee members, thank you for the opportunity to speak and support the application. The proposal in front of us today is for a full planning permission for a single story dwelling. The dwelling has been designed to respect adjacent properties, which has been addressed within the committee report. The professional committee report asked the right questions and has taken reasonable steps to answer those questions, formulating in a recommendation to approve. It is worth noting that the council, as previously mentioned, approved a cluster site to the rear of the adjacent Orange Hall. This council agreed that there is a cluster development at this location, which appears as a visual entity and is located at a focal point and a crossroads. The letter referred to in relation by the applicant in relation to this application was actually a letter of support um, and it was a recommendation for all boundary hedges to be retained. Um, in many ways, this proposal goes above and beyond what is required by policy CTY2A, a policy which is acknowledged as very prescriptive. This is not an infill site, this is a cluster site. Commissioner Mark Watson, in his recent dis appeal decision, 2021 AO 141, allowed an application for a cluster site that, that did not meet all six criteria of policy CTY2A, allowing a development which, and I quote, the proposal is not at odds with the spirit of policy CTYA of PPS 21 taken in the round. In this instance, for this application, however, we do not need to rely on appeal precedents as the current application goes beyond what is required by policy CTY2A. The site is bounded on all sides by existing development, whereby the policy only requires to be bounded on at least two sides. And secondly, the site is located at both a crossroads and a focal point. Again, the policy only requires either a crossroads location or a focal point. All other criteria are met. Furthermore, all consultees are content. In the interest of equity and fairness to the applicant, and given that this council has previously agreed to a cluster within this area, we contend that the recommendation to approve is accepted. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Sheila. Thank you very much uh, to our speakers. Okay, members, over to yourselves for any questions. I'm going to bring in Councillor Lavery, please. Over to yourself, Councillor. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you to all the speakers. I suppose when I was reading through the plans, it was felt a bit like deja vu because it did remind me of an application that did come for committee. I think it was referenced, and I think we refused it on that occasion due to residential media impact from a nearby adjacent farm shed or 
was it a cattle shed or a pig shed or, or something of that nature. Obviously, we, I think, voted that down. Uh, but obviously, this is here recommended for uh, approval, I suppose. Is there, was there any consideration in terms of those residential media impact from that sheds or any other kind of those issues? That would be my first. Great, Chair. Thank you. Uh, yes, Councillor Abbey, you're quite right. There was an application to the north of this site um, for a replacement dwelling, and it was taken before the committee, and we had recommended refusal, and the committee agreed with the refusal. Um, and it was it was due to the proximity to arm sheds and the impact on residential media of the prospective residents. Um, that decision was appealed to the Plan and Appeals decision, and they upheld that uh, recommendation. However, that decision by the PAC was judicially reviewed, and the PAC agreed by consent to quash that decision, so that appeal now it has to be reheard, so that's that's the ongoing appeal that was referred to. Um, but yes, the impact of residential immunity has been considered as part of this application, but given the separation distances, the intervening vegetation and intervening buildings, we felt that you know, there was no reason to refuse this on that basis. Thank you very much. We should go on back in, Councillor. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Roisin. I suppose my second query is when I was looking at this area, both in terms of the information provided in Google Maps, it does start to look a wee bit dense for, for what is, as is noted, a, a rural area outside of any kind of settlement limit. I know we've been provided maps where I'm looking at the one here um, where it's given examples of cluster sites and about you know building in behind dwellings. It's just sort of down in a multi-use laneway, if it's called that. Uh, and they're officers sure that's kind of compliant with with the policy. Is, I don't know if you know, we're being a wee bit restricted here by policy, but on the first look, it just felt a wee bit dense, if that's the correct type of wording. I don't know what the, what the thoughts are on that. Yes, thank you, Councillor Avery. Look, I don't disagree. There has been development pressure here and there has been a number of new dwellings um, approved. However, we have to look at each, ap each application on its own merits. Um, this application has been submitted as an application, you know, as a dwelling within an existing cluster. The council accepts that there is a cluster of development here and um, there is a focal point. You'll see from the report there's, you know, the six criteria for dwellings at existing clusters and we've gone through each criteria and we feel that there is a cluster of development. It does appear as a visual entity. There is a focal point. You know, the application site is, you know, bounded on, on four sides by other development in the cluster. And that therefore, you know, the dwelling can be absorbed within the existing cluster. We've looked at residential amenity. We don't feel that it would impact on residential amenity. And for that reason, we're recommending that the application be approved. Thank you very much. We should go to bring in Alderman Wilson and then Alderman Kennedy. Alderman Wilson, over to you. Yeah, it's just looking at that. I think I, re I remember being out on site maybe at that one, just at the mouth of the access point. Uh, I don't want to raise my concerns at this time, whether that was a a dwelling or not. I remember having a debate about that, and I've had a number of debates since about um, replacement dwellings and whether they constitute or you know resemble dwellings and that, but that's a different argument, obviously, that's, that's still ongoing. But in terms of the proposed site, there is... Uh, structure and you can only see the tin roof of it from the air here in the aerial shot what is that in a sense and what's its impact on the site and I, I, I did hear or you know in the in Roisin's um, where the plan officers report earlier that um, is that subject to another separate development proposal an off-site replacement today or am I getting mixed up there so really just in terms of that existing structure that you can see from the air with a tin roof on it what's what's the significance of that in terms of the proposal before us Uh, thank you, Alderman Wilson. Just to confirm, there's no there's no structure within the red line of the application site. Um, anything that was there has since been demolished. There is a structure just to the northern boundary of the site, which is an outbuilding, but it's not the subject of a, a current application. So that pile of rubble that you can see, is that what's been demolished? In that image where the, the right lines, the right lines, so that's what was that. Um, and then... Obviously, there is some sort of structure beside it. What is that? I'd be keen to understand what that building is 
it looks very much to be within, while it's not in the red line, it does look within the, the same site. You know what I mean? I was out on site here a number of years ago whenever the large dwelling was, it actually went through committee as well as a replacement dwelling and both of those buildings were at that time old outbuildings. They may well have been old farm buildings at one point in time, but they were they were outbuildings. And where that pile of rubble is, is yes, there was a building there, but it, there's no building there on site anymore. Yeah, and I suppose with regards, it, it looks like some sort of farm building. So from environmental health perspective, you know, as has been mentioned, we have issues where farm buildings are in existence and there are a consideration, you know, can that be brought back into use? And then is there an impact for any further residential use of that existing site? Uh, yes, you're quite right. It could it it appears to be an agricultural outbuilding. It could be brought back into use, but it's in, it's within the blue line, so it's within the control of the applicant. So obviously, if it's within the control of the applicant, if there were any issues with regard to nuisance, he would be was bringing that on himself, so to speak. So for that reason, we wouldn't be recommending refusal on that basis. And Alderman, Alderman Kennedy, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Alderman Wilson, I touched a wee bit on the issue of the rubble and that, but regarding there, we have to deal with every application on its own merit. Uh, Mrs. Slager brought in a whole parada of a wider area, but in one alleged allegation, she made a, a suggestion there was a building erected without planning permission. Is the officers aware? of any building in that area or active without planning permission? I was giving him a couple of minutes to get a battery. It's not floating about here, okay? I think that's us back now. Thank you very much. Yeah. Technology doesn't work without batteries. So thank you. Um, and members, we were, uh, I'm just going to bring Ocean back in. Okay. Ocean, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, in relation to the query about um, a dwelling built without plan permission, I'm, I'm not, or a building, I'm not sure what building was specifically being referred to. I know that there are enforcement cases in the area some of which are ongoing, and as they're ongoing enforcement cases, we really couldn't comment any further on them. Yeah. 
Thank you very much, Lucien. And then Councillor Wilson, and then Councillor O'Dowd. Councillor Wilson, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just probably in the same vein as, as Alderman Wilson, as regards agricultural building, I know at the, at the present moment in time, it's still on, it's so under the same ownership as the applicant. Is there any consideration given to future proof that if this property is built and sold, that, that new residents could be subjected to uh, farm animals or agricultural use and in, in, in that she had this existing at the moment? Is there any consideration given to that at all? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. That, that shade's actually outside the red line of the application site, and I fully appreciate what you're saying, but we have to give um, you know, credence to the fact that it is under the control of the applicant at the, this moment in time. And yes, sites may be sold on, but when, you know, when we're considering this type of application, if it's within the control of the applicant, then you know, if any nuisance were to be brought against him in the future, then you know, he would have to take account of that with by making the application in the first place. And you know, that's sort of the view we take on those types of applications. Thank you, Roisin, and thank you, Councillor and Councillor O'Dowd, please. Thank you. Um, just one point. I'd like to ask the applicant about this building because it's it's set, we can see it on the plans. Is there any issues there with it? Is it going to be staying? Is it going to be going? Can you answer that, please? Should you get on to that? Yeah. That, um, that's what in the control of the applicant. Um, I don't know the intention of the, ap the applicant's attention regarding it. Um, it's outside the red line. The other building was um, demolished because it was unsafe. Balanced probability that this building will also be demolished. Um, but other than it, it's outside the red line. It's irrelevant. Um, is that okay? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you, Councillor. And Councillor Duffy, please. Yes, just for clarity, does it actually work in reverse that I know you can't build within 100 metres of a cow shed, but if people take up residence here and they do try and bring it back into existing use, then people could object and it would be torn down because it is within a certain distance and it's not part of a registered farm. Well, there's an existing shed there. So if someone were to move into this site and the shed were to, you know, to be start, you know, if someone could go in and start and use this for agricultural purposes, it is quite small. Um, I don't think there's a lot of floors in it, so it would be quite, you know, low level agricultural activity. But if someone were to move to that site, yes, they could make, you know, a complaint about the proximity of it but as, as you know as i kind of keep coming back to you it's in the control of the applicant if the applicant has any intention to use that for farming purposes you know he, he you know he, he's sort of bringing this as i say on himself and that he's made the application for a dwelling in such close proximity and we have to take that into account want to come back in Councillor? okay no problem care okay, members any other questions Okay, move you on to comments. We're in the debate stage. Councillor Duffy, then Alderman Kennedy. Go ahead, Councillor. Yes, Chair. Uh, I'm looking to say this, but those things actually said, shouldn't have been said, you know, during by the ones objecting to it, you know, referring to one speaking on behalf of the objection, which was totally out of place. There's no call for that there. There's this application, in my opinion, you know, has no objections up the lane. The shrubbery and hedges and all are going to be retained within it. If there's any damage within so many years, they're going to be, you know, replaced. So I am leaning towards accepting the recommendation and we're just sort of just taken aback by some of the comments that were made during, during it. Sure. Yeah, thank you very much, Councillor. And Alderman Kennedy, then Councillor Dowd. Thank you, Chair, for letting me back in. But just regarding it, it's a positive. They're looking buildings within a cluster settlement 
more than grain field out in its own. So the fact that it's, it's located within a cluster settlement, I think, and there's nobody, uh, Councillor Duffy says, uh, there's no, if any of statutory bodies has no objections, and I think uh, uh, we'll have to accept the officer's recommendation. Thank you very much, Alderman, and Councillor O'Dowd, and Alderman Wilson. Councillor O'Dowd, please. Thanks, Chair. Um, yes, I agree with both the two councillors. Um, I don't see any reason why it should be turned down. It's well set away. It's in a cluster, and I agree. I would second if it was to go to proposal. Yeah, thank you. And Alderman Wilson, please. Yeah, I again, given the you know the density of of development already there, I'd like to actually experience this and see it out on site. And I think also, I'd be of the view that in between you know that intervening period, you know we're not in proposal stages yet, obviously, but just you know signifying what I would like would be some detail on the you know Roisin had mentioned existing enforcement cases. I think that's. I think that would be useful to see, you know, what are these issues in terms of enforcement? Obviously, you know, the case, the enforcement cases are still alive. So there's something being considered. I'd like to know what that is. Is it pertinent to what's before us? Is it something that could um, further enhance or improve our understanding of the site? And, you know, in between a site visit and um, this coming back again, you know, that information could be distributed to members in a confidential manner. And I think it'll be very, very useful in the fullest consideration of what's before us. Thank you very much, Alderman. And Councillor Dady, you looking back in? Yeah, go ahead. I, I personally don't see why um, we should go down the route of the other sites that there's an enforcement notes on, because I don't think it's anything to do with this application. And Councillor Lavery. Thank you, Chair. I suppose it's going back to the previous application in the vicinity, which we refused based on proximity to a shed which was of an agricultural nature. Uh, we refused to that on that basis because of the potential residential media impact. As been discussed, we've got another agricultural shed even closer, but we're saying that's not a factor because it's currently in the ownership of the applicant. Conscious that it could be sold on and yeah, and as was mentioned, it could be brought into agricultural use again in terms of that shed. So that's sort of playing in my mind, you know, we're doing one thing in one application and one thing in another. And we're not sure whether or not the shed will be brought into future agricultural use. So that's caused me a wee bit of concern just at the present time when I'm thinking on it. I don't know whether there's any surety we could get around the future use of this shed or if it's is going to be demolished, as I think the applicants mentioned um but certainly caused me some concern at this side at this time that's just my thoughts on it okay. i'm going i'm just going to ask and i know we're backtracking for out of back to the sort of questions just asking the question can you off the the officer can explain the difference between the previous application and the current one. Thank you, Chair. Um, I suppose just to say in relation to the previous application, the one that we'd recommended for refusal, um, that application was beside livestock sheds within 75 metres of the livestock sheds. Um, we knew, you know, the, the, the owner of the farm had told us they were going to put livestock in those buildings. They were concerned about the impact that the dwelling would have on the running of their farm and they articulated that to us. Slightly different in this case in that the building there is it, quite small scale. There's no indication that it's currently used for agriculture. We have no indication that it's going to be used for agriculture and it is in the control of the applicant. Just 
just like to thank Christian for that clarity. I certainly clarified it in my own mind. Thank you. Okay, members. Okay, members, we don't have any more lights on, so I'm going to move on to a uh, decision. Okay, can I take a proposal and a seconder? Okay, so we have Alderman Kennedy. Okay, there's a lot of lights coming on here. Alderman Kennedy then. Okay, sir, Duffy, please. Hey, thank you, Chair. Just given all the this in front of us there and the officers, I think we have no choice but to accept the officer's recommendation. So I probably to propose we accept the officer's recommendation. Answer Duffy. Mr. Chair, I'll second that proposal. And then, Councillor Dyer, I know you did say earlier, but he beat you to the lights. Okay. Yeah. No problem. Okay, thank you. And then, Alwyn Wilson. Yeah, I propose um, a site visit and also the distribution of information pertinent to the ongoing enforcement cases in the cluster zone, if that's where they are. Okay, no problem, Councillor Alwyn, sorry. Um, we have a proposal on on the table, and as you know, we'll take that one first. Um, Councillor Mudry, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. And uh, no, just to uh, concur with um, Alderman Wilson's comments there, um, I'd be happy to second uh, the proposal for a site visit. I think it would be a useful exercise for members here to actually visual visualize uh, some of the the uh things we've we've heard here this evening potential overlooking issues um and, and uh, to actually visualize the the density of the area um and the size and scale of the actual development at hand thank you okay thank you very much councillor okay members we have a proposal in the second there by proposed by alderman kennedy and second by councillor duffy that would go with the officer's recommendation are we all agreed no. Okay. So we're going to vote. Okay. Okay, members. Once you call out your names, yes, no, abstain. Okay. So start off with Councillor Armstrong. Yes, no, or abstain. No, Chair. Councillor Donnelly. Yes, no, or abstain. Ta, uh, yes. Councillor Duffy. Yes, Chair. Councillor Hockey. Yes, Chair. Councillor Lovely. Sorry. Yes, Chair. Councillor Mullen. Yes, Chair. Councillor McGill not here. Councillor Mitre. No chair. Councillor Mulholland. No chair. Councillor <clears throat> O'Dowd. Yes, Chair. Alderman Wilson? No, Chair. Councillor Wilson? No, Chair. Alderman Kennedy, the Vice Chair? Yes. And the Chair? Yes. Yeah, but with me, members. Yeah, members, yes, eight, no, five. Yeah, so the 
recommendation by the planning officers uh, is passed. Okay. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for your time, members, and our visiting speakers. Okay, moving on to Appendix 8. Okay, yeah, members, moving on to uh, Appendix 8, application number LA08-2021, 0492F. And it's an approval, and I'm going to bring in Roisin Hamill, Principal Planning Officer, to present the report and PowerPoint presentation. Okay, yeah, members, there is an addendum report has been circulated, circulated and it's within your minutes, okay? So over to yourself, Roisin. Thank you, Chair. This application seeks full planning permission for the retention of 14 dwellings and associated site works and lands to the rear of 25 to 28 Mount Hall Grange and opposite numbers 13 and 14 Mount Hall and 1 to 12 Robinsonstown, Clonmacate Road, Birches. While the applications for the retention of 14 dwellings is built, it also proposes the demolition of an existing unauthorised dwelling, which is to be replaced with an area of open space. The application is being presented to committee as it attracts objections from more than four postal addresses. In January 2006, full plan permission was granted by the former DOE for the erection of 74 dwellings on lands which include the current application site. The first phase of the development was constructed in 2007 and consisted of 30 dwellings. It has recently come to officers' attention that the dwellings were not built in accordance with the 2006 planning permission. However, they were substantially complete in 2007 and for that reason they are considered to be lawful. As these 30 dwellings were not built in accordance with the 2006 permission, officers consider that the plan of permission has not been implemented and therefore has now lapsed. The application site lies within the development limits of the Birches and is not zoned for any particular use. Policy QD1 of PPS7 requires new residential development to demonstrate that the proposal will create a quality and sustainable environment. Policy QD1 identifies nine criteria which proposals for residential development are expected to comply with. These have been considered in detail in the report and as set out, officers consider that the proposal does not comply with PPS7 or the supplementary planning guidance provided by creating places on the grounds that it fails to provide a quality and sustainable residential environment. There were a number of objections in relation to the proposal and all of the issues raised have been considered in detail in the report. Officers consider the proposed development does not comply with the LDP, the SPPS, PPS7 or the supplementary planning guidance provided by Creating Places. Notwithstanding that, officers in recommending the plan permission be granted are giving weight to the following matters. The planning history on the site and the fact that the principle of residential development in this site was accepted in 2006 by the then DOE. The developer had constructed the dwellings before learning that the 2006 permission had lapsed. The similarities between the 2006 plan permission and the current application in respect of the number of dwellings proposed on the application site, the scale and massing of the dwellings and the overall layout of the development, and the betterment in terms of increased private amenity space provision and open space provision. On this basis and subject to the conditions, it is recommended that plan permission be granted. And I'll just take you through the slides.
And this gives you an idea of where the an idea of where the application site is, just to the north of the Birches roundabout within the development of Birches. And this gives you an idea of the settlement limit of Birches as set out in the Craig Avon area plan. And this is the aerial context of the site. You can see to the right the 30 houses that were built and completed in 2007. And then our application site is the site that's outlined in red. And again, this is the red line of the application site as submitted as part of the application. This is the proposed layout. So this is for the retention of the 14 dwellings. You can see there, um, and you can see the private amenity space areas are all shaded and the open space areas are shaded in the heavier green. You will note from my report and from or from the report and from my presentation that there is one dwelling to be demolished. So the dwelling that you can see highlighted in yellow here was built. It was didn't form part of the previous permission. Um, it's built in an area that was open space or you know, side garden of an adjacent property. Um, it doesn't comply with you know quality standards that in terms of creating places, and this application or this proposal the proposal is to demolish this dwelling, and that has been conditioned accordingly. Uh, these are the proposed house types that have been built and are to be retained. And again, another the different proposed house types with the front re return. And another proposed house type on the site. And these are cross sections through the site. This is the layout that was approved back in 2000, approved 2006 for 74 dwellings. And these are photographs of the site. Now, this photograph is taken from um, just as you come up the Robinson's Town Road. Now, the dwelling that you see there just behind the lamppost that fronts out onto the Robinson's Town Road, that's the dwelling that is proposed to be demolished as part of this application. The house you see in the foreground is part of the original approval and the, that was constructed back in 2006. And the yeah. dwellings, those are the rear of the dwelling. Some of the 14 dwellings are to be retained as part of the site. Again, the house on the end is the house that's proposed to be demolished. And this just, just gives you an idea of the back-to-back -back separa separation distances of Mount Hall, the existing development of Mount Hall Grange. And this is a view from further up uh, the Robinson's Town Road, just looking down towards into the development. And that area in the middle there will be the proposed open space as part of this application. And that's just another photograph within the development of the existing dwellings that have been built and are to be retained as part of this application. And that concludes the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wishing Members. We have uh, Carl Lockhart, MP, to make representation objection to the application. We also have Mr. David McMaster of David McMaster Architects and Lindsay Dodds to make representation in support of the application. Um, Carl, again, you have five minutes, and David and Lindsay, are you both you speaking or just, just yourself, David? No, Lindsay, no problem. Thank you. Lindsay, you have three minutes. Um, Time to speak. We have also written representation objection, which have been received received by Jennifer Wright, which are in your reports. Okay, over to yourself, Carla. Welcome back again. Um, you have five minutes whenever you start. Clock starts. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you again to the committee for taking the time to listen to my representation today. Don't intend to spend terribly long uh, in the hot seat today on this one, and hope we have and are at a point of resolve on this matter. Since summer of 2020, uh, I've raised strong representation on the part of residents living in the main opposite to the site in question, the 1 to 12. Robinson's town. Whilst these residents uh, would love this to have remained a green field uh, site, we are sensible enough to recognise that there was previous planning approval on the site. And furthermore, uh, it's zoned for development and there are already residents living in some of the houses. So I have no objection um, to the vast majority of this site bar the house at the front of the development, which I know has been excluded from this application with conditions placed on it. The crux of 
my and the objector's concerns are that a large house that has been built directly facing a number of the properties in, in Robinson's town uh, continues to, to remain on site. This house in particular has a significantly larger footprint than the rest of the site. It has not been built in accordance with any agreed plans, members will also be aware that Robinson Town is a long-standing pre-established settlement which has uh, seen its character adversely impacted by this particular property. Local residents have raised with me their concerns about how this building has been of detriment to their amenity, natural lighting and, and privacy. And if you look at the pictures provided, you will see that the front door even opens out onto the, the pavement. So we would have a safety um, uh, issue as well. Furthermore, it is little parking provision in an area that is always uh, having considerable pressure with regards to parking spaces, resulting in many residents having to park a considerable distance from their properties. My ask of the committee today is to ensure that the condition is watertight in ensuring that this building is removed uh, with permission for the rest of the site to be granted because I think the rest of the site looks very well. Um, it's welcome that it is built out uh, and and almost completed uh, if the green uh, space is, is fulfilled as well. Uh, and that there needs to be a continued watching brief to ensure that the approved plans and conditions, particularly around the house, are adhered to, and that the house, the site where the the house is to be demolished, is actually left in a a good state of repair, given that a building is going to be demolished. I have no concerns. I do believe uh, that, that this will be honoured, but I just want absolute clarity, and I feel that it's important that the committee get that absolute clarity in this uh, discussion this evening. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Carla. I'm going to bring yourself in, Lindsay. You have three minutes. Welcome to the committee. Uh, time will start whenever you start. Just give it sort of a couple of seconds for the clock to set up. Okay, over to yourself. Mr Chair, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. My name is Lindsay Dodds and I am a resident of Mount Hall Grange. Um, this last three and a half, coming up to four years previously of 15 years of living in Robinson's town itself. So um, I'm a local. Um, this is a welcome development for the majority of the community and as it will contribute to the overall improvement of the local area. Um, an improvement will result in the provision of jobs for local members of um, our community during construction and a safe area for our children to play um, with the green zone that I know the developer has um, has got on the plans for us. Um, it will provide major improvements to safety in the existing residents in both Robinson's Town and Mount Hall Grange with the provision of road improvements, footpaths and additional parking. Um, at present, the, the footpaths going up through Robinson's Town um, at, the, at the front of the development is poor, so with the, the development, this is going to be improved. I'm aware of the objections that have been received in relation to the development, and although everyone is entitled to their opinion, I would like to point out that this is not reflected of the majority of the residents who support the development. Um, with a um, with a majority of the um, the residents actually signing um, a form to say that uh, recently that that we were in the um, support of it. As a community, we've previously advised the planners of any inaccuracies that we did have in the object uh, in the objections, and are, we are pleased to see that they have been considered um, in the report. As a community, we are concerned that the application has been ongoing for now three and a half um, for three years and support the recommendation for approval. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Lindsay. Well done. And Councillor Lavery, get us started. Go ahead, Councillor. Thank you, Chair. It's just a quick query. You wouldn't be familiar with the uh, development itself, but just on photo five there, it's just in relation to the green. Um, I just want to make sure that it's all going to be a usable green. Let's say like there's a large pile of soil that's, you know, obviously grown over with grass. I don't know if that's the exact location there in 405 of the green, but just to make sure for my own benefit that it's going to be all leveled out and that the kids aren't going to have to climb this mound here if they want to play, play on it. So just, that's just my only query, Chair. Okay. Is that, can you take that up yet? Are you taking that, Roisin, or do you want the reason to take it up? Yeah. Go, we'll go with Roisin then. 
Uh, yes, councillor, as part of this application, that is to be levelled as a village green and there's to be additional planting planted along the boundaries. And certainly, you know, obviously we want it to be open green space and we've actually got a condition on to say that um, that it should be managed and maintained in accordance with the landscape management plan. Um, and that's condition number seven. And any changes or alteration to the approved landscape management arrangements have to be submitted to us for our consideration. So, yes, certainly that's you know part and parcel of this, that that would be an open village green, a usable open space for the residents. Thank you. You got off that then, David. Um, Alderman Wilson, please. Yeah, thanks. I suppose it's just regarding um the conditions and that. I know it includes given the you know the addendum that we received there where the um where the correspondence was issued to the occupier of 16 Robinson Town confirming the proposal includes the demolition of one dwell and that's the dwell obviously that has been discussed. Is there, you know, a choreographed sort of procedure here, you know, in the event of an approval where prior to any further works being undertaken that the demolishment would take place and it was a retention, but you know, there's obviously um, the potential for further development in that area. So, is it a case where this, are we going to be on the case here in terms of the demolishment of this building and the creation of the, the green space? I'd like some assurances on that or some indication that, you know, council's going to be on the on the ball with this in terms of, a, you know, the enforcement of it. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, obviously, you'll see from the report that we have a condition on that this dwelling be demolished within three months of the date of this permission, which is quite a short time frame. Um, given the level of involvement here and the level of interaction we've had, if that were not to be done, I suspect we it would be highlighted to us. And at that point in time, yes, we, we do have an enforcement case ongoing on this site. So, yes, at that point in time, we certainly would be pursuing that. Thank you very much, Alderman. Members, any more questions? Councillor Mulholland, please. Yes, Chair, thank you for letting me in. Um, it's just when this house, the minute that's causing issue, is demolished, I just, obviously, is, is that just going to be left then as an open space or is there something else going to be put there instead of it? That's the only thing I was looking at now. Uh, the proposal is to include part of that portion of the site within the private amenity space of the dwelling situated at number 39 and then the remainder would be open space so it would be landscape that would be it would be grassed out and trees planted and maintained in accordance with the landscape management plan thank you very much councillor and thank you very much we've seen any other questions members yeah councillor duffy just one uh how did the Plan committee or sort of brass tack of this builder get so far to actually build the house completely, or was he not made aware beforehand this was just just not acceptable? Like? Sorry, can I, can I just clarify in relation to this specific dwelling? Yeah. Obviously, I can't speak on behalf of the developer, but I suspect. You know, as 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 we've said, like, there was planning permission granted here for seventy four dwellings back in two thousand and six. The first phase was built, and he, you know, the developer went in then in good faith to complete the development. The development wasn't built in accordance to the approved plans. He may well have thought he was complying with the the approved plans, but there was no house approved here. Um, and yes, it was brought to our attention. You know, once the house started to go up, um, he put an application in to retain it. The original application. This was part of the retention, but obviously we were concerned because it really doesn't have sufficient private amenity space. You know, and it isn't a quality residential development. And then the, the application was amended to remove this from the proposal. And that's why we're with, with the application we have today. Yeah, I just understand that, you know, you'll have to go back through the electric company, the water board, the whole lot, you know, and all that takes time. And there's a three month, you know, thing to get this house demolished. And... You know, sometimes with them agencies, three months might be enough. I suppose following off that question, what what is the recourse then after three months if 
the the building isn't going, or is that the enforcement? Yeah. Yes, Chair, that would be the referred to the enforcement team and they would have to then consider what action they're going to take, whether they're going to serve an enforcement notice. Okay, okay. thank you very much, members. Okay, members, move on to debate. Any comments, concerns? Councillor Duffy, please. Yes, Chair, thank you. Uh, it's great to see the houses going up in the area. I know the council has invested in new play area and all in the and just down from that there, and it's really good news for the school and the community. Just glad to see it. Thank you, Councillor. Any other comments? Okay. Move on to decision time. Okay, can I get a proposal of second of sorts? Councillor Mulholland and Councillor Larry just beat you to it. Councillor Mulholland, go ahead. Yeah, I'd like just to propose that one accept the officer's decision and accept us. Thank you very much, Councillor. And Councillor Lavery, please. Thank you, Chair. Happy to uh, second uh, the recommendation to approve there. It's good to, I suppose, get this one resolved and ensure that that area does become a good quality residential area there for, for families. Thank you very much, members. Proposed by Councillor Mulholland and second by Councillor Lavery for the officer's recommendation. We all agreed? <laughs> Agreed. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. See you at home. Okay, members. Uh, we're going to take a, a quick, well, not a quick, a, a bit of a break. Um, we will be back at, if you so on soon, uh, 18.45, I suppose, would be, if we're ready to go before that, we will start again, but um, we'll go for a quick break, okay? Thank you.
live feed. Thank you. Okay, members, appendix 11, application number 2023-2757F, and it's down for an approval. Um, Kelly Elders, Senior Planning Officer, is going to present the report on PowerPoint presentation. Over to yourself, Kelly, and welcome. This plan application has been submitted by Portland Football Club and seeks full plan permission for the upgrading of Shamrock Park to include the demolition and replacement of an existing spectator stand with the erection of a new stand providing 1,046 seats, function room, community facilities and club facilities, erection of a dome structure for training purposes, provision of sporting slash community space under an existing stand, relocation and upgrading of the existing grass pitch to an artificial pitch, Direction of new turnstile block, new toilet block, and provision of car parking and coach parking spaces. The upgrading and use of an access onto Fitzgerald Park, extension of footpath along Fitzgerald Park, and other ancillary works and associated site works. The application is before you this evening as it is a major plan application. Officers have taken it, members have read the report in full, and as such, this is a synopsis only. The application site is located within the development limit of Portadown as defined by the Craigavon Area Plan 2010 on on-zone white land. The use of the site as a sports stadium with training areas established. In policy terms, the site meets with a definition of an intensive sports facility as defined by PPS 8. The principle of development for the replacement of the spectator stand and several uses and development, sports dome, and sporting community units are considered acceptable in the context of the Craigavon Area Plan. The SPPS and policy OS4 of PPS8. Conditions have been including, sorry, included requiring the use of the sporting and community uses to be uh, proposed to be ancillary to the main use of the land as a sports stadium. Officers consider the proposed development in the whole as of a scale, design, layout, and material finish appropriate for the character of the area and for the intended use of the development. All proposed buildings or structures are considered to be of an appropriate scale and size and will not be in Congress or inappropriate with the townscape, nor would any element appear physically dominant from public vantage points in the vicinity of the site. Officers are therefore satisfied that the development accords with the SPPS, Policy OS4 of PPS8 and Policy DES2 of Plan Strategy for Rural Northern Ireland in terms of design and layout. Members are advised that the proposed stand is approximately 1.2 metres lower than the height of the stand to be replaced. The, the proposed sports dome would be 10.2 uh, metres high at its highest point and would offer better noise attenuation over the outdoor facility currently on the site. The pitch is to be moved southwards by approximately 2 metres towards the south stand. Uh, the re relocation of the pitch and associated relocation of one floodlight by approximately 9 metres is considered to be acceptable. Regarding amenity, a noise and odour impact assessment has been provided, as has an overshadowing analysis for the sports dome. The Environmental Health Department have been consulted and raised no amenity concerns. Officers consider that appropriate conditions have been proposed to ensure that the proposed development does not unduly affect the amenity of any neighbouring property, including restricting the times of the proposed artificial pitch and sports dome can be used. The overshadowing analysis demonstrates the proposed dome would not have an impact on the property surrounding the site, primarily as the existing boundary wall would screen the, those, these properties from any shadow being cast by the dome. Officers are satisfied that the proposal accords with the Craigavon Area Plan, the SPPS and PPS8 in respect of all aspects of the amenity, or sorry, the impact on amenity of the proposed development subject to the conditions suggested. At present, the site contains a, sport, uh, a football stadium with a training area and car park providing 110 parking spaces within the cartilage of the site. The site is currently accessed from the Brownstown Road, but this application proposes the formalization, formalization of uh, vehicular access onto Fitzgerald Park, the extension of an existing footway, and the alteration and extension of parking provision at the site. The pros access on Fitzgerald Park is not proposed to be used by match day vehicular traffic and has been conditioned as such. This access is considered to comply with policy MP2 of PPS3. Members are advised that currently there are no restrictions on the number of spectators who can attend this football ground in planning terms. 
As discussed in detail in the report, officers have, officers have recommended a condition to restrict the capacity of Shamrock Park to 3,490 spectators. This condition, for the first time, sets a restriction in planning terms on the number of spectators who can attend matches and ensures that the proposed new stand does not result in an intensification in the use of the stadium. The proposal provides an additional 90 parking spaces to give a total of 200 dedicated on-site parking spaces. The development would provide uh, will provide an additional 246 seats in the stadium. So parking standards would require an additional 83 spaces, and as such, the additional 90 spaces meets and exceeds the parking standards for the proposal. The proposed a sports dome is to be conditioned to only operate at times when the main pitch is not being used by Porter Iron Football Club. The proposed 200 spaces within the car park would adequately cater for the sports dome in the context of uh, parking standards. The parking arrangements are deemed to be acceptable. In respect of access, movement and parking, DFI roads have raised no objections and officers are satisfied that the proposal accords with the SPPS Policies AMP2, MP7, MP8 and MP9 of PPS3 and Policy OS4 of PPS8. Members will note from the report that officers raise no concerns regarding natural heritage, flood risk and drainage or the ability of the development to handle foul sewage for the reasons stated in the report and subject to the relevant uh, inclusion of the relevant conditions. The relevant consultees also raise no objections on these grounds and officers consider the relevant policy requirements to have been met regarding these issues. Officers received 10 third-party representations, which included nine letters of objection and one non-committal letter from four postal addresses regarding this plan application. The main objection reasons have been fully considered in the report, but the objection reasons mainly related to immunity concerns, which officers consider to have been addressed by the suggested conditions. So overall, officers considered the proposal to comply with the Craigavon area plan, the policy requirements of the SPPS and all other relevant planning policies, and on that basis, approval is recommended for the reasons outlined in the report and subject to the conditions suggested in the report. I'll just take you through the presentation. Okay, so the site is uh, located southwest of Borderline Town Centre. Next slide then just shows the uh, site location plan with the application site outlined in red. Next slide then just shows the, the site within the wider context, which you can see is primarily a uh, residential development surrounding the site. And then the next slide is uh, an aerial overview of the site. So you can see the football pitch which is to move southwards, the three spectator stands, and then the training area uh, to the north of, of the pitch. So this is the uh, proposed site layout plan. So you can see just the red dot uh, is the western stand, which is to be, which is proposed. And you may be able to make out just the green area of, of the uh, existing western stand, which is to be demolished. The green dot then is the uh, proposed sports dome, and then you can just see the associated parking around the site that's also proposed. Uh, this is the floor plans of the proposed spectator stand, and followed by the elevations of the uh, stand. Uh, this is the floor plan of the sports dome, and uh, the elevations of the sports dome. So Sports Dome requires a plant, as you can see on the next slide, which is to be located at the front of the Sports Dome. Uh, for the, the southern stand, at present, there's a void underneath that stand. So it's proposed to put in the community and, um, sorry, sporting community units under those. So that's the floor plans and the elevations of those units. Uh, these are just your turnstiles and bathroom elevations. And then one, there's currently four floodlights and one of the floodlights is required to, to be relocated by approximately nine meters to facilitate the development. So it's just an elevation and then just some of the fencing details. Uh, this is just the cross sections. So the top two show the sports dome. The top one, you can just see the sports dome mm -hmm. in relation to the size of the existing stand. And then the bottom uh, cross section there, you can see the proposed stand with in relation to an existing stand. Uh, 
there's a new access being proposed to be formalized onto a uh, Fitzgerald Park. So that's just the details. Okay, and then the next slide into the photograph. So this is a photograph of the Western stand, which is to be demolished and replaced. And the next slide then will show just the rear elevations and the same again on the next slide. Next slide then is uh, facing towards the uh, northeastern section of the site in which the sports dome is proposed. And then on the next slide, you'll just be able to see the existing training area in grass, which is currently being used. It's just a photograph just showing the, the pitch, which is to be put into synthetic pitch. And then this photograph is off the southern stand. So this is the, the pit, grass pitch will move two meters closer uh, to that stand. And at the rear of that stand, uh, the sport and community uses are proposed. So just on the next slide, You'll see just the side and the rear. So the rear is currently enclosed by that wall and that wall is to be demolished, which will open up the site uh, for parking. <laughs> so it just was difficult just to show you the void. Uh, it's just quite overgrown. So that's just the void under that southern stand. So this is the access uh, from the Brownstown Road, the primary access to, to the site at present. So the southern stand would be to the left and that wall is to the left is to be uh, demolished as part of this application. Uh, this is just an existing area of car parking, which will again be used for car parking and the car parking will be formalized in this area of the site. And again, car parking will also sorry, be uh, located uh, in this area of the site towards the, the western stand. This is the current access from the, the Brownstown Road. And this is the uh, access point from, you can just see the gap in the hedge where there's a gate. So that's uh, to be formalized uh, from Fitzgerald Park and the hedge to the left then will be removed and a footpath will be uh, led there to connect to existing footpaths for pedestrian safety. Next couple of slides are just really just a few further contextual ones. So this photograph has been taken from the Brownstown Road. You can just see the red dot above the floodlight. So that's the floodlight which is to be moved uh, southwards by approximately nine metres. So it'll be, be moving to the left there and the sports dome would be visible between those two properties. Uh, the next slide then, it's uh, taken at the entrance to numbers one to 13, the manor. And you can just see the sports stadium and again, that, that floodlight was to be removed. But again, you would be able to see the sports dome from this vantage point. And again, then this uh, has been taken from the entrance to numbers 14 to 27, the manor. And just the two houses in the middle between the two there, you would see the, the sports dome again. And then finally, uh, that's just a contextual photograph. You can see the Western stand to be demolished to the, to the right, uh, Fitzgerald Park. A road there and then some of the existing housing that's back runs onto onto the application site. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Kyle. I'm going to bring in John Skelly, who is from Carlin Planning to make representation as the agent in support of the application. John, you're very much welcome. And John, you have three minutes um, to give your presentations. Whenever you start, the clock will start, okay? Over to yourself. Sure. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, thanks to the members for the opportunity to speak in support of the application today. Um, this is a major application submitted seeking full planner permission for the upgrading of Shamrock Park, a football stadium located in the heart of Port of Down. Uh, specifically, the proposal seek the replacement of the now vacant uh, spectator stand located towards the western boundary of the site. The proposal seek to replace the existing 800-seater stand with a 1,046-seater stand, representing a minor increase of 246 seats. Uh, in addition, the proposal includes the provision of training facilities on the northern area of the site, which will be accommodated within that dome structure, and the existing grass plane pitch will be upgraded to a 3G plane surface. Uh, other other works or other minor works are required to accommodate the proposals, which include the slight relocation of the pitch by two meters, relocation of run of the floodlights, uh, upgraded turnstiles, uh, vehicle and cycle parking, 
uh, and a new access point is proposed off Fitzgerald Park to the west. Uh, in addition, it is proposed that the vacant space uh, beneath the existing south stand is used for the uses complementary to the wider use of the site. So that's things like physio space, for example. <clears throat> Uh, Shamrock Park, it represents a, an important parcel of open space, sports and recreation for Portadown. It's considered a community asset which has potential to offer so much more uh, than it currently does. Uh, the existing stand cannot be used because of health and uh, safety reasons, with the club reliant upon standing space that matches and the existing training facilities within the site are just not fit for purpose. Uh, existing car parking provision is not formalised and the pedestrian and vehicular circulation could be much more effective. Uh, the proposals by Portadown FC will provide a much needed upgrade to the existing facilities, including for better circulation, better access arrangements and car parking provision. The proposals seek to enhance the community offering within the area, opening up the site to the wider community by, by, by providing training facilities that can be used by not just the club, but also schools, the public and other organisations. In relation to the relevant planning policy context, particularly that set out within the SPPS, the Craig Avon area plan and, po plan and policy statement eight, the principle of development is considered acceptable. In relation to other material planning considerations, such as neighboring amenities, visual impact, access and parking, the proposals were supported by a range of supporting information, which demonstrated that the proposals were acceptable in regard to all relevant planning policy. Uh, the applicant has worked closely with the council and statutory consultees through pre-application discussions and through the determination of the application and we've engaged extensively with the community through pre-application community consultation phases. The applicant has made numerous amendments to the application to alleviate any minor concerns raised, and we've also agreed to all negative planning conditions to ensure, that, to ensure compliance with the recommendations of the specialist reports and the surveys that were undertaken. It's concluded that there are no impacts on residential amenities by way of dominance, overlooking, noise, odour or air quality, and there are no additional visual impacts as a result of the scheme. We agree with the council's recommendation to approve it. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. Yeah. Members, you'll also be aware that uh, Nell Curry from Environmental Health is also here to answer any questions. So the floor is open to yourselves if any questions. No, we're getting away lightly. Can I ask you a couple of questions, please? So, um. A long time ago, uh, I can remember going over to watch Glen Avon usually beating Porter down. Um, but there was also stock cars there, so there would have been a lot more people attending Shamrock Park than sort of the current 3,000 plus that's earmarked for now. Um, so I'm just sort of, how did we arrive at that um, figure? As you know, there's local grounds that will be able to host bigger football matches in terms of even just facilitating the stand and um, obviously the, the nature of their pitch and stuff they got there but um, there's that part of it and then sort of just really sort of looking towards the reasoning behind the first team only um, because equally it could be a cup final played there which means then that the, the sort of the negative implications are not there or second, their second stream could also. So, who then sets out that it is the first team? Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you, Kate. Yeah, within the within the TAF that was submitted with the application, there's obviously been a, quite a lot of numbers put forward of the number of spectators who originally were at at the site so think back in the 90s they were saying it was generally it could have been over 6,000 but there's newspaper articles within the TAF I think that were over 10,000 spectators so really the starting point for officers because there hadn't been any restriction um, we we looked at what had been approved so the uh, southern stand had been approved and the uh, eastern stand whenever the western stand was in operation so we took took all those numbers and we added added them up and then obviously whenever we added in the new replacement stand we got an increase of 246 seats I believe 
So there has to be a parking provision for that uh, increase in capacity. So when we put through parking standards, I think uh, there was 90 spaces provided and there's about 83 roughly that were required. So we felt that in terms of the parking and to make sure there wasn't an adverse impact on amenity, that it'd be appropriate to restrict the number of uh, spectators. So we have uh, had discussions with, with uh, the representatives of the club on that and we did loosely come to an agreement that that figure then would be be appropriate and that was our reasoning for doing so. A uh, in terms of the um restrictions on, on the uh, sports dome for example uh, not be able to our concern was if Portadown had a large match against one of the large teams that had a large number of supporters there wouldn't be the parking provision there. Uh, so the Obviously, then there's going to be a fallout of that onto uh, the surrounding areas, and it, it, the the site would be far too congested. So, we've we're sort of content that there hasn't been an intensification here in the use of this stadium, and it's just to try and prevent any of that overspill. So that's why we applied it only to Port Down Football Club on the basis that uh, the first team will be the one with the largest number of uh, spectators, rather than the, say the reserve team or any youth team, for example, that would be. Be using that facility. Okay, thank you very much. And same to yourself, John. How do you find the, the restrictions? Or I suppose you can't really speak on behalf of the club, but in terms of what your sort of views are on it and conversations, in terms of the restrictions being played, in terms of but it will just outline. What's your thoughts on that, please? Um, no, you're absolutely right. The spectator numbers in the past have been much, much higher than what we're currently uh, getting as part of this application. But conversations with the club, they're more than content to accept that restriction of just over 3,000. In actual fact, attendance at the matches, mainly as a result of the existing stand being closed, hasn't even reached that figure. But the hope is that subject to plan and approval, that we can actually get up closer to that number in the future. But no, the club are more than content to, to accept that restriction. Yeah, well, that answers that question then. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Kate. Any other questions, members? Yeah, move on to debate. Any comments or queries? Councillor Lavery, Councillor Duffy, and Councillor Armstrong. Councillor Lavery, please. Thank you, Chair. I suppose I firstly thank Kyle for, for the presentation and for um you know the the uh, agent there as well. I think it's a very well thought out application. Clearly, a huge amount of work's gone into it. Obviously, judging from the photos that from the stand that's replacing, I've seen a lot better days. Um, and I like the way obviously the thought about how to improve people's safety in terms of getting into and getting out of the stadium through additional entrance and additional footpath and. And just improving the uh, an underutilized um part of the stadium and the 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 area under one of the other stands to maximize what what they have there, so it, it seems to be a very strong application potentially one of the strongest I've ever seen at this committee in the last five years or so. So, I'd, I'd be uh of the view that the approval would be a correct outcome in this case, chair. Thank you. Thank you, councillor and councillor Duffy, please. Yes, Chair, thank you. Agree with all that was said there. It's no good supporting you support it down. You know, it's glad to see a point of clarity. Uh put it down's actually twenty one and Glen Evans twenty from two thousand and five, Chair. I'll leave the rest of the slang until later. <laughs> Councillor Armstrong, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think this is a, a, a very good news story, not just uh, for the Port of Down, but for Northern Ireland football in general. Um, I've been here many times, unfortunately, in the away end. Um, and uh, I've also been there to watch a couple of Northern Ireland on the youth teams play there. And we've had some players that have went on to represent Northern Ireland and represent other nations that have played at Shamrock Park. Um, I think with these new facilities, this new stand, the sports dome, we will see a centre of excellence here within within the borough uh, for sport and, and for football in particular. But 
no, very happy to see this, and I welcome uh, this this uh, application to the committee. So I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Armstrong. Okay, members, no other lights on. Can okay, we move on to decision time? Can I get a proposal on a seconder, please? Rock, paper, scissors, sorry, guys. Councillor Armstrong, please. And then Councillor um, Mulholland. I'll, I'll give it that. Um... Councillor Mulholland, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, no, uh, great to see this, and uh, hopefully it'll be definitely will be a benefit for the local area. I would just like to accept the officer's proposal and propose that uh, we all accept this, and the uh, transmission is obviously given to the club. Thank you, Councillor and Councillor Armstrong. Please. Yes, happy to second the proposal. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, members. Proposed by Councillor Mulholland that we accept the officer's recommendation. Second by Councillor Armstrong. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Thank you very much, members. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you very much, John. We move on to Appendix 6. Okay. Application number LA08 2023 1893F. And it's an approval. I'm going to bring in Nicola Craney. Nicola, just trying to find you there. Over to yourself, Nicola, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'm taking both Appendix 6 and 7 together as they're the same proposal, just applied for under a full planning application and a list of building consent. And there's actually one presentation. The proposal for both then is for an extension to the existing listed school building to provide additional education provision in line with current DENI standards, a new standalone nursery unit within the playground and a new pedestrian access to Clara Street and associated site and landscaping works at Lurgan Model Primary School. Works will include the demolition of an existing small toilet block, adjoining the existing rear elevation of the school and removal of temporary mobiles. Just as a background, this is an existing school site. There are 208 pupils at the school, primary one to primary seven and 26 nursery school pupils. It's a consistent, I'm sorry, it is consistent with a seven class based primary school. There are 11 teachers, including the principal, 18 non-teaching support staff, three catering staff and 32 staff in total. There are 23 car parking spaces, which were which are accessed off Brownlow Terrace and the parking provision was previously approved under LA08 2019-1131. Um, there are no changes proposed to pupil or staff numbers. This proposal is to provide more suitable accommodation. In terms of the principle of development for the full application, the main planning policies are set one and com one of the Craig Avenue plan, as well as the SPPS and a planning strategy for rural Northern Ireland. Within the planning report, officers have considered this as well as design, layout and landscape treatment, impact on the built and natural heritage as the existing school is a grade B listed building, access traffic and parking, impact on residential amenity, other environmental considerations, third party representations and the relevant planning policies for each of these. There are no objections raised by the consultees, historic buildings, DFI roads, environmental health, NIEA and NI water. There are four third party objections to the proposal. The report has considered the concerns of residents in Clara Street in full within the report. The main concern is the use of an existing pedestrian gate for the proposed nursery and potential traffic and parking issues. The school are only seeking to use this gate for the nursery section of the school and possibly any of their siblings. As this is an existing gate, there are no planning restrictions on its current use. In terms, sorry, the recommendation for the full application is to approve and a number of conditions are set out in the planning report. In terms of the list of building consent, officers have considered the principal determining issues to be the impact of the list of building on the list of building and in particular whether the proposal preserves the building and features of special architectural historical interest um, that they possess. 
As advised in the file application, the character design materials and details have been considered in full and both officers and historic buildings are content. The recommendation for the list of building consent is to approve and conditions have been provided and I'll go through then the one presentation for both. So as you can see, this site is actually um, in Lurgan. It's just, um, it's quite close in proximity to the Lurgan train station. It's an old historical building, so some, some people might know it. Um, that's an aerial then of the existing site. Next slide. And this is a, an aerial image then from, from Google Earth. Next slide, please. Um, this is the site location plan. Next slide, please. Um, this is the proposed layout. So you can see the extension then um, at the back of the building and then the, the standalone nursery. Next slide, please. This is the, the floor plan of the nursery unit. Next slide, please. Um, and this is the elevations. Next slide, please. This um, an extension, the extension floor plan. Next slide, please. Um, and that's the elevations. There's some landscaping proposed as part of the application. Those are the details. Next slide, please. <clears throat> it's a computer generated image of the nursery, of the extension in the nursery units. It's, it's very good in terms of showing exactly what it's going to look like. Next slide, please. And this is a, the, a view of the existing, um, the front of the school. You can see it actually, just as you're coming into Lurgan train station, it's on the left-hand side. Next slide, please. That's a view of the, that's the gate that has raised concerns, but as I said, there is an existing entrance there and there is no planning restriction in terms of opening that as a pedestrian access. Next slide, please. This is a view now of the back of the school looking towards Clara Street. You can just see the wall and the, the doorway in the, in the wall. Next slide, please. That's the access then from inside the school. Next slide, please. That's a view then back then towards the school and that small block just um, behind the school, that's the toilet block which is being removed and then this extension then will go um, in place, in position of it. Next slide, please. Um, and this is the rear of the school building just looking across. Next slide, please. And this just shows, the next two slides are just showing that there's other amenity space within the school in terms of um, for play provision and um, outside yard. Next slide. Yeah, so it shows both. I think that completes the presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Nicola. Okay, members, Appendix 6, uh, any questions? Okay, move on to debate. Any comments or queries? Nope. Can I seek a proposer and seconder proposed by Alderman Wilson? Second by Councillor Lavery? Are we all, yes? Yep. With the officer's recommendation, are we all agreed? Agreed. Okay, thank you very much. Move on to Appendix 7. And again, and again, Nicola, you're in the, it's the same one. So we're just happy to take a proposal and sign report. Yes, okay. It's the same one. So can I get a second proposed proposed by Councillor Lavery, second by Alderman Wilson for the officer's recommendation? Are we all agreed? Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicola. Uh, move on to appendix appendix nine, application number LA 2024 0230 S54 and it's an approval and we're going to bring back Kyle uh, Kyle Elder Senior Planning Officer to present the, the report and PowerPoint presentation over to yourself Kyle This plan application is a section 54 application which seeks to remove condition 11 of plan approval LA08 2023 2218F which is granted plan permission for part change of use of an existing factory from ancillary storage to production, erection of an extension to an existing factory, 
erection of a detached ancillary warehouse, retention of an ancillary warehouse building, retention of an extension of the site to provide external storage space and HTV parking, and all associated plant parking and site works at Halfpenny Valley Industrial Estate in Lurgan. This uh, plan application is required to go before the plan committee as a second to remove a condition of a major plan and application. Officers have taken that members have read the report in full and as such this is a synopsis only. Section 54 of the Plan Act Northern Ireland 2011 is a part that allows for an application to be made for planning permission for the development of land without complying with conditions subject to which previous planning permission was granted. In considering an application made under Section 54, members must only consider the question of the conditions subject to which planning permission should be granted. Consequently, the scope of members is in principle more limited when dealing with the Section 54 application, though members are entitled to consider the circumstances that led to the previous original uh, conditional grant of plan permission. So condition 11 of the original plan approval required that no development takes place in site until details of the method of sewage disposal has been agreed in writing with the council and thereafter implemented. This condition was requested by the Water Management Unit of DERA. In support of this application, the agent has clarified that condition 11 is not necessary on the basis that uh, the original planning application did not propose any additional file sewage connections. In addition, the drainage assessment provided with the original plan and application has also been submitted in support of this plan application. Section 5 of the drainage assessment explains that there be no change to the file drainage uh, volumes and as such no changes to the existing file infrastructure is required. Both the Water Management Unit of DERA and NI Water, the competent authorities on matters related to sewage infrastructure, have raised no objection to the removal of the condition. Officers, therefore, in this instance, are content for the removal of Condition 11 and are content that its removal creates no conflict with the SPPS or the policy requirements of Policy PED 9 of PPS 4 and Policies NH1 and NH5 of PPS 2. Members are advised that no letters of objection have been submitted regarding this plan application. So overall, officers uh, consider the proposal to meet the policy requirements of the SPPS and all other relevant planning policies. And on that basis, approval is recommended for the reasons outlined in the report and subject to the conditions suggested in the report. Uh, Chair, just on this one, as we've nothing to show, I don't have a presentation on this one, just given the nature of, of this particular application. Yeah, thank you very much, Kyle. Uh, okay, members. Open to yourselves, any questions? Any comments? And the debate, any comments? Councillor Duffy? No. <laughs> okay, can I seek a recommendation? Okay, Councillor Duffy? I'm happy with the officer's recommendation. Remove. Okay, proposed by Councillor Duffy. Can I get a second there? Second by Councillor Donnelly. We all agreed? Okay, can I Proposed by Councillor Duffy, second by Councillor Donnelly. All agreed. Thank you very much, members. Move on to Appendix 10, application number, and thank you very much, Kate. Appendix 10, application number LA08 2023 3026F, and it's Armas City, Bombers, and Craig Edinburgh Council, and it's an approval. I'm going to bring in Sinead McAvoy, Planning Manager, to present report and PowerPoint presentation. Sinead, you've been nice and quiet there all evening, so welcome to you. Okay, over to you. Thank you, Chair. The proposal is for the erection of an extension and refurbishment to the existing FE McWilliam Gallery, including installation of solar panels and all associated site works, including landscaping and car parking area. And the reason is before the Plan Regulatory Service Committee tonight is because it's an application made by the Council. Office have taken that members have read the report in full and such as a synopsis only. Members are advised that while the Council is the applicant for this application, this is completely immaterial to the termination of this plan application, as is any financial or other advantage to the Council, which may arise from the termination of this application. It goes without saying that the Council must exercise its planning powers for proper planning reasons only and not for any other alter ulterior purpose. As detailed within the report, the application site is located within the development limit of Banbridge Urban Area. The proposal is considered a community and cultural use of the plan, in which plan policy ECU1 favours such proposals in settlement limits subject to certain criteria. 
As set out in detail within the report, the proposal meets all the criteria therein. The proposal is therefore in compliance with area plan, just that a sequential assessment, a retail impact assessment, and an assessment of need is not required. Design and layout and amenity, this has all been set out in detail within your report and following consultation with the appropriate competent authorities, officers are of the opinion that the proposal is in keeping with the size and character of the settlement limit and its surroundings, does not prejudice the comprehensive development of surrounding lands and will have no significant detrimental effect on amenity. As regards to access, traffic and parking, the existing access arrangement will be used. The parking proposed meets the parking standards. In, addi in addition, coach parking and cycle stands are being provided, as is electrical charging spaces. Officers in consultation with DFI roads are content with the proposal on these grounds. All other material planning considerations have been set out in detail within your report and officers have consulted with the appropriate consultees who have all raised no objections to this proposal. There have been no third party objections to this proposal. Officers consider the proposal complies with the development plan, the strategic plan and policy statement and all other relevant plan and policies. Officers taken into consideration all other material matters raised in, in response to consultation and are satisfied that any material harm that development may otherwise give rise to can be offset by the conditions attached to your report. And this reason is recommended plan of permission be approved. Just taking it through the PowerPoint rep, uh, presentation members. So that just shows location of the site within the general area. So it's in the southern edge of a uh, Banbridge urban area. Uh, next slide, please. So that's an aerial view of the post site. So as you can see, it's a discrete parcel of land adjacent to the one motorway. Next slide, please. That just shows an aerial view of this or the site location plan. So the site um, is outlined in red. It's a site that's owned by the council. Uh, next slide, please. That shows uh, the site layout plan. The access location is to remain the same, but parking is to be revised uh, and increased to meet the parking standards, as is provision of cycle prov um, stands and uh, electrical charging spaces. Next slide, please. This is existing opposed elevation. So the one on the upper end outlined in red is the existing, and then the uh, elevation treatment under it outlined in green is uh, the proposed um difference just to show you the difference side by side of the existing proposed elevations. Uh, next slide please. That's floor plans and contextual elevations. The bottom section uh, of your screen is the ground floor plan and then you can see now there's going to be a new first floor plan to accommodate um, office space and associated meeting and toilet area. Next slide please. That's contextual elevation to the front of the building. So there's a new front going on, as you can see. And the extension there is to the left-hand side. And the extension is trying to uh, replicate and, and uh, take account of the existing building as well, uh, but of a larger uh, floor space uh, and an upper floor. Next slide, please. That's just another contextual elevation of the front and side of the building as you re uh, rise to the site uh, from the excess. Next slide, please. This is just a couple of photos from the front of the building of the existing um, foyer area. Next slide, please. That's just into the rear. As you can see, that's the cafe area. So that's going to be uh, extended. There's going to be an, an area there that you can actually a, a draft proof door. And there's an extension of the cafe seating area to the left hand side. Next slide, please. That's just from within the site and looking out, as you can see uh, the development at Lotus Green, the opposite side of the road. The site is actually well screened from all public vantage points. Next slide, please. This is actually um, a Google image rather than a photo taken uh, from Newry Road around about near one. And as you can see, the site is a discrete part of land in behind that existing vegetation. Uh, so as regards to visual immunity, officers have raised no concern. Um, and that's, that's me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Sinead. Yeah, members, over to yourselves. Any questions? No questions. Okay, move on to debate. Any comments or concerns? Councillor Wilson. Um, thank you, Chair. As I'm sure you're well aware as myself, that guess has caused a uh, a bit of discussion around the Barnbridge area about uh, the development of this, but it's only about welcomed. Any investment within the Barnbridge DEA is, is welcomed. Um, 
there was sort of criteria around uh, the the funding for to get this work done, and um, we were lucky enough that it was in Bond Bridge and on a on the main arterial route for between Belfast and Dublin, and it's only but welcome that we are getting that that funding on this uh, site developed. Thank you, Chair. And Councillor Lavery, please. Thank, thank you, Chair. I suppose in terms of the plan aspect, I think it is another strong application. I think we're all, all agreed that the approval is, is the right way to go. But just in the general you know, topic of investment in the arts, I think more investment in the arts is, is a good thing. But it's positive to see this happening in our bar, I suppose, that, that kind of frame of it. But in terms of planning criteria, I think it's, it's ready to approve. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Councillor. Yes, and it's also future proofing it for future years with the EV as well. Okay, no more comments. Okay, members, can I push it for a resolution? Can I seek a proposal? Councillor Wilson, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, happy to propose a recommendation. Thank you. And Councillor Lavery, happy to second, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, members. Proposed by Councillor Wilson, second by Councillor Lavery that will. With the officer's recommendation. All great. All great. Yep. Thank you very much. Okay, members. Um just one wee tiny item to backtrack on. Uh can I seek a proposal in second or to go into confidential business to pick up a wee bit of AOB? It should be quick. Um, can I seek a proposal? Proposed by Councillor Lavi, second by Councillor Duffy. All agreed. Agreed. Can I ask ACT officers to please turn up?